Good morning and welcome to the October 2021 almost Halloween open meeting of the Federal Communications Commission. Madam Secretary, would you please introduce our agenda today? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Good morning to you and good morning, Commissioners. For today's meeting, you will hear two items for your consideration and a two panel virtual hearing. First, you will consider a national security matter. Second, you will consider a public notice announcing the third round of selections for the Commission's Connected Care Pilot Program to provide Universal Service Fund support for health care providers, making connected care services available directly to patients. Third, you will conduct a virtual field hearing on communications recovery and resiliency during disasters and hear testimony about communications issues during and following Hurricane Ida and other recent disasters. This is your agenda for today. Please note item two entitled updating digital television table of allotments as listed on the commission's October 19th sun sunshine notice has been adopted by the commission and deleted from today's agenda. The first item on your agenda is a national security matter for your consideration. The item will be presented by the International Bureau. Thomas Sullivan, Chief of the Bureau, will introduce the item. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Because this order is a national security matter, we are going to switch up the order just slightly at the Commission, just as we've done in past cases that involve similar presentations at open meetings. As with all open meeting items, the Bureau circulated this item to every commissioner at least three weeks ago. But there is longstanding practice at the agency that we do not publicly disclose national security or pre-decisional awards until and unless the commission decides to take action. And for these types of items, that means the agency formally votes on the item. Then here's a brief presentation from the Bureau before proceeding to any statements that the commissioners may have. This process ensures that the sensitive matters will not be publicly disclosed until the FCC has voted to take action. We're following that precedent here. So we will now proceed directly to a vote on item one. And we will begin on item one with Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. And the chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges if requested. Mr. Sullivan, please proceed with introducing item one on today's agenda. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Congress created the commission, among other reasons, for the purpose of the national defense and for the purpose of promoting safety of life and property through the use of wire and radio communications. Promotion of national security is an integral part of the commission's public interest responsibility, including its administration of section 214 of the Communications Act and indeed one of the core purposes for which Congress created the commission. The commission has taken a number of targeted steps to protect the nation's communications infrastructure from potential security threats, and it continues those efforts today. This order on revocation and termination revokes China Telecom America's Corporation's domestic 214 authority and revokes and terminates its international section 214 authority. The order you have adopted finds that the present and future public interest, convenience and necessity is no longer served by China Telecom Americas retaining these authorizations. I thank the staff from the International Bureau, Enforcement Bureau, Wireline Competition Bureau, Office of General Counsel, Office of Economics and Analytics, Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, and Office of Engineering and Technology for their collaborative work on this item. Gabrielle Kim of the International Bureau will present the item. Good morning, Acting Chairman Rosa Russell and Commissioners. In April 2020, several executive branch agencies recommended that the Commission revoke and terminate the International Section 214 authorizations of China Telecom Americas based on a substantial and unacceptable national security and law enforcement risks associated with China Telecom Americas continued access to US telecommunications infrastructure. Among other statements, the executive branch agencies indicated that China Telecom Americas failed 
to take all practicable measures to prevent unauthorized access to U.S. records and failed to inform the executive branch agencies of applications it filed with the commission, which violated two conditions of its 2007 letter of assurances with the executive branch agencies, compliance with which is an express condition of China Telecom America's international section 214 authorizations. Based in part on the recommendation of the executive branch agencies, the Commission's International Bureau, Wireline Competition Bureau, and Enforcement Bureau issued an order to show cause on April 24, 2020, directing China Telecom Americas to demonstrate why the Commission should not initiate a proceeding to revoke and terminate China Telecom Americas domestic and international Section 214 authorizations. On December 10, 2020, the Commission adopted an order instituting proceedings on revocation and termination and memorandum opinion and order, finding that China Telecom Americas failed to rebut the serious concerns of the executive branch about its retention of its authorizations and continued presence in the United States. The Commission adopted procedures that allowed for China Telecom Americas, the executive branch agencies, and the public to present any remaining arguments or evidence in this matter. Based on the Commission's public interest analysis and the totality of the extensive unclassified record alone, the order you have adopted finds that the present and future public interest, convenience, and necessity is no longer served by China Telecom America's retention of its Section 214 authority. First, the order finds that China Telecom Americas, a U.S. subsidiary of a Chinese state-owned enterprise, is subject to exploitation, influence, and control by the Chinese government and is highly likely to be forced to comply with Chinese government requests without sufficient legal procedures subject to independent judicial oversight. Second, Given the changed national security environment with respect to China, since the Commission authorized China Telecom Americas to provide telecommunication services in the United States, the order finds that China Telecom Americas' ownership and control by the Chinese government raise significant national security and law enforcement risks by providing opportunities for China Telecom Americas, its parent entities, and the Chinese government to access, store, disrupt, and or misroute U.S. communications, which in turn allow them to engage in espionage and other harmful activities against the United States. Third, independent of these concerns, China Telecom America's conduct and representations to the Commission and other U.S. government agencies demonstrate a lack of candor, trustworthiness, and reliability that erodes the baseline level of trust that the Commission and other U.S. government agencies require of telecommunications carriers, given the critical nature of the provision of telecommunications service in the United States. Fourth, given the record evidence, the order finds that further mitigation would not address the significant national security and law enforcement concerns. The order therefore revokes China Telecom America's domestic and international Section 214 authority. Fifth, Separate and apart from the findings concerning revocation, the order terminates China Telecom America's international Section 214 authorizations based on China Telecom America's willful violation of two of the five provisions of the 2007 Letter of Assurances with the Executive Branch Agencies, compliance with which is an express condition of its international Section 214 authorizations. Finally, Although it is not necessary to support these findings and conclusions, the order finds that the classified evidence submitted by the executive branch agencies further supports the decisions to revoke the domestic authority and to revoke and terminate the international authorizations issued to China Telecom Americas and the determination that further mitigation will not address the substantial national security and law enforcement risks. Accordingly, the order directs China Telecom Americas to discontinue any domestic or international services that it provides pursuant to its Section 214 authority within 60 days following the release of this order. Thank you. Thank you.
We will now hear comments from the bench. Commissioner Carr. Thank you. Uh, in 2019, when we blocked China Mobile from entering the U.S. market based on national security concerns, I said it was time for a top to bottom review of every telecom carrier with ties to the communist regime in China. Uh, with that type of review in mind, we launched an inquiry, uh, including one here on China Telecom. And while our reviews continue on other entities, I'm very pleased that we're bringing this one to, to a close. Uh, we're voting to revoke China Telecom's domestic international section 214 authority. Uh, in my statement, uh, for the record, I walked through some of the evidence that the item uh, recounts. Uh, here, I'll simply say this, that while today's vote is an important step forward, the FCC must remain vigilant to the threats posed by the Communist Party of China and those that would do its bidding. And on this score, I've urged action on several fronts. First, we should quickly adopt final orders in our other Section 214 investigations. Second, we should close the loophole in our equipment authorization process to ensure that equipment from Huawei and other entities that pose a national security risk will no longer be eligible for FCC approval. Just last week, the House passed legislation sponsored by Republican Whip Scalise and Congresswoman Eshoo that would require us to take this action, but there's no need for us to wait for that bill to become law. We can and should move quickly to close the Huawei loophole. Third, we need to ensure that we have a clear and efficient process in place for adding new entities to the FCC's covered list. Last week, I highlighted this issue as part of remarks where I called for the agency to begin the process of adding DJI, a Shenzhen-based drone company, to the FCC's covered list. As I laid out in a release, the evidence against DJI has been mounting for years, and various components of the U.S. government have taken a range of actions, including grounding fleets of DJI drones, based on security concerns. The DOD just affirmed this past summer that DJI drones pose potential threats to national security and confirmed that they're still barred from general use by the DOD. Yet a consistent and comprehensive approach to addressing DJI's potential threats isn't in place. So the FCC should take the necessary steps to consider adding DJI to our covered list. After all, we do not need a Huawei on wings. Turning back to today's decision, the this one presents another opportunity to look at updating the agency's covered list. The determinations reached by the executive branch agencies regarding China Telecom Americas appear sufficient to trigger the process of adding them to the FCC's covered list under our existing rules. So I'd encourage the commission to take that action since it could impose additional restrictions on China Telecom that go beyond the scope of our section 213, 214 authorizations. Finally, I'd like to thank the staff from the International Bureau for their work on this item, as well as staff from across uh, the national security agencies who participated in the process. The item has my support. Thanks. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Commissioner Starks. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. There are those out there who would attack our telecom networks. In just the last few months, we've learned about a hacker stealing the personal data of more than 50 million customers of a major American wireless carrier. We've read accounts of hackers penetrating the systems of critical U.S. telecom backbone provider as well, gaining access to cell phone data for millions of users over a five-year period. And then just last week, a cybersecurity research firm disclosed that hackers have been breaking into the computer networks of telecom companies across the world since 2016. And so one of the reasons, as was mentioned, that Congress created the FCC was to protect our networks from attacks like these. But even as hackers continue to attack through the back door, we face another threat from the front door, carriers that are owned or otherwise associated with adversary states. And these companies seek or possess commission authorizations to interconnect with U.S. networks and provide services with U.S. Uh, within the U.S. to American citizens and foreign nationals. And so, uh, you know, according to the executive branch agencies with access to our networks, locations in our country, these companies can and do access, monitor, store, disrupt, misroute U.S. communications, misuse customer information, facilitate espionage and other harmful activities. Although we've acted against several such carriers, China Telecom is distinctly 
clearly an example of a company subject to the control of an adversary state. The company's parent is majority owned and controlled by a Chinese government owned enterprise, and that parent is directly accountable to the Chinese Communist Party and must consult with its representatives prior to making any decisions on material issues. And so like other Chinese carriers, China Telecom must disclose sensitive customer information whenever the Chinese government demands it. And so based upon the information presented by the executive branch agencies, these risks are not theoretical. China Telecom's US records are already available to its non-US affiliates abroad. And uh, in addition, as detailed in this item, China Telecom has a record of inaccurate representations to the FCC and other U.S. government agencies. Uh, so I'll have a longer uh, statement, uh, but thank you, of course, to the International Bureau and all the Commission staff that worked on this item. Uh, but clearly, based on the totality of all of these circumstances, our decision to revoke China Telecom Section 214 authorization is well-founded. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Starks. Uh, Commissioner Symington. Thank you. The FCC recently engaged in a comprehensive assessment of telecom providers with connections to China. The FCC opened investigations into several carriers, including China Telecom, to determine whether they pose a threat to our national security. Today, we take the next step towards concluding one such important investigation. The Commission correctly concluded that China Telecom, a U.S. subsidiary of a Chinese state-owned enterprise, is subject to exploitation, influence, and control by the Chinese government. It is likely to be forced to comply with Chinese government requests without sufficient legal procedures subject to independent judicial oversight. I support the Commission's determination to revoke China Telecom's domestic and international Section 214 authority and to terminate its international Section 214 authorization. And I want to thank the staff of the International Wireline Competition and Enforcement Bureaus for their hard work. This item, of course, has my support. Thank you, Commissioners. The Federal Communications Commission has a long history of working to open American markets to foreign telecommunications companies when doing so is in the public interest. These connections can make us stronger because they help us share our democratic values with the rest of the world. But we also recognize that not every connection is consistent with the national security interest of the United States. That's because some countries may seek to exploit our openness to advance their own national interests. When we recognize this is the case and cannot mitigate the risk, we need to take action to protect the communications infrastructure that is so critical to our national security and economic prosperity. And that is what we do here today. We take an important and necessary step to protect that infrastructure by revoking and terminating China Telecom America's authority to provide interstate and international telecommunication services in the United States. This is not a decision we make lightly. It has support from each of my colleagues and it has support from across the federal government. In fact, last year, a broad group of executive branch agencies, including the Department of Justice, Department of Defense, Department of State, Department of Commerce and the United States Trade Representative formally recommended that we terminate FCC authorization for China Telecom Americas, provide interstate and international telecommunication services in the United States. At about the same time, the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations issued a report on the threats that Chinese state-owned carriers pose to our telecommunications networks. In doing so, they highlighted a problem. But across the federal government, there has not been enough oversight to safeguard our networks against evolving threats after the issuance of a license. So that brings us to the here and now. Since the Subcommittee on Investigations released its findings, the FCC has increased its oversight of telecommunications networks. That is why, following both regulatory and judicial review, we have reached the conclusion that it is necessary to terminate domestic and international Section 214 authority for China Telecom Americas. Our record makes clear that China Telecom Americas operates as a subsidiary of a Chinese state-owned enterprise, and as such, the Chinese government has the ability to influence and control its actions. That could lead to real problems with our telecommunications networks through surveilling information, misrouting traffic, or disrupting service. Moreover, the record reflects that China Telecom Americas has not been forthright in its representations to the FCC and other agencies. As a result, mitigation measures are not adequate 
to address our concerns and revocation of existing authorizations are justified. This, however, is not the end of the story because our response to this one provider this one time is not enough. As the Subcommittee on Investigations pointed out in their report, we need to work with our federal partners to ensure sufficient safeguards and oversight mechanisms are in place. First, now that we have completed our review of China Telecom Americas, we are moving expeditiously to complete our security reviews for similarly situated carriers like China Unicom and ComNet. Second, with this decision, we have established a clear standard and process for revoking a foreign carrier's existing authorizations when there are national security concerns. Before today, that didn't exist. Now companies will understand the circumstances under which authorizations could be revoked and what due process is available to challenge potential revocations. Third, consistent with the recommendations of the Subcommittee on Investigations, the FCC is coordinating with executive branch agencies on implementing periodic review of foreign carriers authorizations to provide service in the United States. This will help ensure that we can stay on top of evolving national security law enforcement policy and trade risks. Fourth, the FCC is taking a closer look at applications for submarine cables to make sure they do not raise national security concerns. For too long, it was the practice of this agency to unilaterally grant applications special temporary authority to start building submarine cables while their applications were pending, even if those applications reflected ownership by state-owned companies that could represent a national security risk. That's no longer the case. Requests for special temporary authority to start construction can raise national security concerns too. And the FCC now sends such requests to the Committee for the Assessment of Foreign Participation in the United States Telecommunications Services Sector for coordinated security review. Thank you to the staff that's worked on all of these efforts, but especially those who worked on this decision today. So let me call them out by name. They include Denise Coca, Kate Collins, Kim Cook, Francis Gutierrez, Jocelyn Jezeremy, Gabrielle Kim, David Kretsch, Wayne Layton, Adrian McNeil, Tom Sullivan, and Troy Tanner from the International Bureau. Pam Arluck, Marcelle Burlough, Melissa droller kirkle Jody May, Rodney McDonald, Chris Monteith, and Terry Natoli from the Wireline Competition Bureau. Jeffrey G, Rosemary Harold, Pamela Kane, and Christopher Killian from the Enforcement Bureau. Patrick Brogan, Robert Cannon, Matthew Collins, Cher Lee, Kate Matres, Julia McHenry, Virginia Matalo, Donald Stockdale, and Emily Talaga from the Office of Economics and Analytics. Padma Krishwami from the Office of Engineering and Technology. Kenneth Carlberg, Stephen Carpenter, Lisa Folks, Jeffrey Goldthorpe, Curry and Jacob, Deborah Jordan, Lauren Kravitz, Nicole McGinnis, Jeffrey Goldthorpe, Curry and uh, Curry and Jacob, Deborah Jordan, Lauren Kravitz, Nicole McGinnis, and I think I'm repeating a few, but Zenji Nakahawa, Erica Olson, and Austin Rondazzo from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, Edward Bartholomew from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, and finally, Michelle Ellison, Doug Klein, David Konskow, Jacob Lewis, Scott Novick, Joel Rabinowitz, and Bill Richardson from the Office of General Counsel. This is truly an all-hands effort. We're grateful for their work. Now, Madam Secretary, please announce item two on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman, Commissioners, the second item today is entitled Selecting Third Round, Ap third round of Applicants for Connected Care Pilot Program and will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau. Chris Monti, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Like the last item, this public notice was circulated to the commissioners three weeks ago but because it involves the selection of projects for the pilot program, which is treated as non-public pre-decisional information until we vote, we're going to proceed to a vote on the item before the formal presentation. And we'll begin with Commissioner Carr. Approved. Commissioner Starks. All right, Commissioner Starks. I think he's checking to see if the Kansas City Chiefs have improved recently. Know, he's, gonna be, no, he's gonna be deeply I, disappointed when he gets the answer. I think he is, um, he's got the, his uh, voice uh, clicked off there. But we're gonna do it out of order. Commissioner Symington. Approved. All right. We will uh, wait until Commissioner Starks was returned.
Is that you, Commissioner Starks? Oh, goodness. All right. We're going to make her an effort to reach out. I'm not going to move four if you want. I guess maybe three votes. That might be, is that enough, you think? Here is the general counsel available. Can we check with them to make sure? All right, just hold for a second and we're going to try to locate <laughs> Commissioner Starks. All right. Madam Chairman, I think it's fine to move forward. We're trying to reconnect with Commissioner Starks. You do have a majority for the item. Thank you to Michelle Ellison, who is serving as our general counsel. Uh, if that's true, and we're, uh, then we will move ahead. The chair will vote aye. Uh, and I can, think I can assume under the circumstances that the item will be adopted with editorial privileges if requested. Over we'll court Commissioner Stark's vote after the discussion. So Chris Monteith, can you please proceed? Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Thank you for your consideration and votes on today's item. A public notice selecting a third round of projects to participate in the Connected Care pilot program. As always, I would like to thank the entire team for their hard work on this item. Matt Baker, attorney advisor in the Wireline Competition Bureau, will now present the item. Matt? Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. With the adoption of today's public notice, the Commission selected a third round of projects to participate in the Connected Care Pilot Program. The Connected Care Pilot Program is a three-year program for selected pilot projects for qualifying purchases necessary to provide connected care services, with a particular emphasis on providing connected care services to low-income and veteran patients. The projects selected in today's public notice were reviewed by the Bureau to determine whether they would treat a high number of low-income or veteran patients and treat specific medical conditions, as well as whether the applicants have experience providing telehealth services, whether they primarily seek funding for eligible services, and whether they are located in geographic areas most in need of universal service support for connected care. The selected projects will help to provide remote patient monitoring, diagnostic imaging, video visits, and other services for patients dealing with maternal health issues and high-risk pregnancies, mental health issues, opioid dependency, chronic conditions, and infectious diseases. These projects cover 36 applications from 26 applicants in 18 states in Washington, D.C. that are collectively seeking over $15 million in funding. With the adoption of today's public notice, the pilot program has selected 93 projects seeking approximately $69 million. Selection of the projects in today's public notice furthers the goals of the pilot program to improve health outcomes through connected care, reduce health care costs for patients, facilities, and the health care system, and support the trend towards connected care everywhere. Applicants for the projects selected in today's public notice must competitively bid services and file a request for funding with the Universal Service Administrative Company, which will issue a funding commitment if appropriate after review. The Wireline Competition Bureau appreciates the Commission's adoption of today's public notice and the grant of editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you. Before we hear comments from the bench, I just want to check is Commissioner Starks available so we can record his vote? Yes, apologies for the delay. I am uh, in approved. Thank you. Thank you. We will start with uh, comments from Commissioner Carr. Uh, thank you so much. I'm very, very pleased that we're moving forward with this decision today. You know, for years, the FCC supported the build out of high speed internet to brick and mortar healthcare facilities. And that is important work. That's work that will continue, uh, ensures that patients have access to high quality care when they're in a facility. But several years ago, we identified a new emerging trend in telehealth, which is the delivery of high tech, high quality care isn't limited to the confines of connected facilities anymore. It's a, effectively the healthcare version of switching from blockbuster video to Netflix. If you have a smartphone, a connected tablet, you can get high quality care wherever you are. So back in 2018, I asked my colleagues here to support taking a look at whether we could stand up a program to support that new trend in telehealth. And that ultimately culminated both in the Connected Care Pilot Program uh, and also the Emergency COVID-19 Telehealth Initiative. And since then, since 2018, I've had the chance to visit with 44 different healthcare facilities uh, across 22 different states to learn about how they're using this type of telehealth technology. And, uh, 
one thing that became clear, particularly during the pandemic, was the just uh, unprecedented spike in telehealth usage. Just recently, I was in Parsons, Kansas. I found a healthcare provider there that saw telehealth visits jump from close to zero before the pandemic to about uh, 1,200 each month. And uh, look, I know it's been a long time since someone uh, at the FCC has properly represented uh, Parsons, Kansas as a community. Some would say it's never really been uh, properly represented, but I was you know, very pleased to spend time there. I think it's one thing to be you know, born and from there. I think it's another thing uh, to prioritize uh, Parsons, Kansas and spend time there uh, as I have done. And I was, uh, I was pleased to, to get a chance to do that. Uh, but our work obviously isn't done. There's more to do. I testified in Congress recently about some steps we can take to ensure the long-term financial stability of programs like this. And my uh, full statement for the record here will walk through what some of those ideas are. So I'm very pleased to see that we're moving forward with some more support and funding today. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Starks. Yes, uh, I am pleased to approve today's uh, order announcing the Connected Care Pilot Program's third set of projects. Uh, during the last year and a half, the COVID-19 pandemic has confirmed the importance uh, and, and how essential telehealth is to our country's healthcare system. And many of today's projects and many others already selected, you know, the pilot program will promote innovation in telehealth, more patient access, and particularly in underserved communities. Several of the projects we select here today, uh, including the Charles Judd Community Health Center, Long Island Select Healthcare, Metro Health, New York Psychotherapy and Counseling Center, and Bronx Child and Family Mental Health Center, Norwegian American Hospital, the New York Community Broadband Partnership, all of those will serve patient populations that are 100% low income. Deeply proud uh, of that. And so thank you to the staff for their hard work. Uh, and I look forward, of course, to hearing the results. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for calling out those projects. Uh, Commissioner Symington. Uh, I'm pleased to support this item, and I'm, as always, humbled by the uh, pioneering efforts of my colleagues on the Commission and of agency staff in not only introducing this pilot program, but in the ongoing work of continual improvement to it. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. Uh, look, these are days when public health is front and center, and the reason why is obvious. This pandemic has struck so many of our communities and upended so much in our daily life but these times have also revealed that we are resilient. That's because when new threats come along, we develop new ways to get along. And you see this so clearly with healthcare. When this cruel virus first visited us, our nation's healthcare providers did something extraordinary. They pivoted fast to telemedicine. They made it possible for so many of us to stick with our providers, keep up with our appointments and seek diagnoses safely. I'm proud that the FCC has been able to support this effort on multiple fronts. First, thanks to the CARES Act, this agency provided $200 million in support for telehealth projects when this pandemic first swept across the country last year. Second, building on this earlier effort, Congress gave us an additional $250 million to help develop the COVID-19 telehealth program to assist healthcare facilities during this crisis. And now here today, we offer even more support with an additional round of funding in our Connected Care Pilot Program. As you may know, the Connected Care Pilot Program is a $100 million effort to fund a range of healthcare providers, including community health centers and rural health clinics, to deliver telehealth services directly to their patients with a special focus on low-income and veteran patients. The program focuses on a number of conditions, including maternal health and high-risk pregnancy, infectious diseases such as COVID-19, mental health and opioid dependency, and chronic conditions like diabetes and HIV AIDS. Today, we announced the third round of selections for this program, funding 36 applications seeking over $15 million in funding. And over the first three rounds of this program, we've selected a total of 93 projects seeking $69 million in funding in 36 states and the District of Columbia. Today's selected applicants include a diverse group of providers, but I'm particularly excited to see a number of applicants focusing on maternal health, including the Children with Special Health Needs branch of the Hawaii Department of Health. It's an area where we sorely need to improve outcomes in the United States, and there's evidence that expanded use of remote treatment, video visits, and imaging services can help. A big thank you is in order to the healthcare providers who are embracing the possibilities of telemedicine 
during these pandemic days. I'm also pleased that this agency can be a small part of helping them do so. So for today's effort, special thanks go to Matt Baker, Brian Boyle, Adam Copeland, Rashan Duval, Abdel Ikwa, Veronica Garcia Ula, Trent Parkrader, Clint Highfill, India McGee, Chris Monteith, Kiara Ortiz, Nick Page, Ryan Palmer, Nagin Sanjar, Joe Schlingenbaum, and Haley Steffen of the Wireline Competition View, and Michelle Ellison, Elizabeth Lyle, and Bill Richardson of the Office of General Counsel. Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. Madam Chair, Woman Commissioners, third on your agenda today is a disaster communications virtual field hearing. All right, um, let me check with my uh, colleagues here. Would you like us to take a brief recess before we start or are you ready to move straight away? For my vote, I think we can keep rolling. Uh, all right, all right. Uh, speak first uh, and we will follow. Thank you, Commissioner Stark. Um, so I wanna make sure that we've got our panelists uh, joining us and ready to go. Can you confirm for that, that us that that's true, Jeff, and our technical team? All the panelists are on for panel one. So panel one, please turn your cameras on and remember to remain muted if you're not speaking. Well, thank you. Here, I will get started. Um, and so again, good morning and welcome again to the October 2021 open meeting of the Federal Communications Commission. And I'm now gonna transition us to the next portion of today's agenda. Today's virtual hearing is going to focus on improving the resiliency and recovery of communications networks during disasters. This hearing is designed to explore lessons learned from Hurricane Ida and other recent disasters and inform commission recommendations and actions to bolster communications reliability. And I'm gonna start with an opening statement and then turn the floor over to my colleagues so they have the opportunity to do the same. So one more time, welcome to our field hearing on improving the resiliency and recovery of communications networks during disasters. From the start, let's acknowledge we're doing this virtually. It's not your typical FCC field hearing, but what I believe we really do need to make typical is that after a disaster where communications networks fail, we do more than just bemoan what happened. We do more than express our sympathy. Instead, we engage in a serious effort to identify what went wrong, what went right, and how we can do better in the future. Last month, I traveled to Louisiana with Commissioner Carr. We crisscrossed a long flat stretch of the state that was affected by Hurricane Ida. And here's what struck me. Wind and water can be so cruel. Weeks after the storm hit, there were still mangled store signs along the road and piles of refuse waiting to be cleared away. But there was also sheer determination. I saw it in everyone we met and everyone we had the privilege to speak to, state public safety leaders in Baton Rouge, 911 call center operators in Livingston, broadband companies in Laplace, and first net officials in Raceland. Everyone we spoke with wanted to tell us their stories and give us their ideas. They wanted us to know with precision where communications networks failed in the storm and how better preparation and more resilient networks could help save lives. And some of the people that we spoke to are joining us today to share their experiences with all of you too. And that includes Captain Jack Bernardo from the Livingston Parish Sheriff's Office and Janet Britton from Red Broadband. And we carried all of their words back to Washington and started a rulemaking last month to explore steps to improve the reliability and resiliency of communications networks during emergencies. I really wanna thank my colleagues for supporting this effort. Likewise, I wanna thank them for participating in this hearing today. I've long said we need to make it a standard practice for the FCC to learn as much as possible from every communications outage. And when feasible, this should include timely field hearings. So with the recovery from Hurricane Ida well underway, now is a really good time to take this opportunity to gather new information and lessons learned. Because of course we know another storm will come. It's not just hurricanes along the Gulf Coast. We've seen snowstorms in Texas and fires blazing out West. We know there will be more events that test our communications infrastructure. And I believe it's time to better prepare our networks for that future. And to do that, we must investigate aggressively, follow the facts wherever they may lead, and find out what went right and what went wrong. I think there are four areas in it that especially deserve our attention right now. Let me just cover them briefly. First, when disaster strikes, we need to be able to use all available infrastructure to connect as many people as possible. 
In Louisiana, I heard how our voluntary wireless resiliency cooperative framework helps speed up service restoration for so many people in affected areas. And under this framework, wireless carriers opened up their networks to provide mutual aid to their competitors' customers through reciprocal roaming. But Travis Johnson, the program manager at the Governor's Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness, pointed out that setting up these kinds of arrangements only after a storm hits is already too late. On top of that, there was confusion about the status of roaming, what were, was available, and what technologies were really being used. So I think there's room for improvement. Second, we need to promote better situational awareness during disasters by ensuring that life-saving information is being communicated to all stakeholders who need it, especially public safety. Captain Jack Bernardo is here with us today. He runs a 911 call center in Livingston Parish, Louisiana. When we spoke last month, he explained to me that in so many cases, 911 call centers are the last to find out about major outages that might affect the public's ability to reach emergency services. That just doesn't seem right. When 911 call centers have this information, they're very good at pre-planning to have these calls rerouted to other call centers or to administrative lines. So I think we need to explore ways to get public safety the actionable information they need to save lives. Third, we need to better prepare for power outages and the consequences for communications. We know that lack of commercial power at communications facilities is a big reason for communications failures following disaster. And with this in mind, we need to explore communications resilient strategies for power outages, including better coordination between communications providers and power companies, as well as improve backup power. Fourth, we need to promote equity in disaster recovery. Those hardest hit by storms in their aftermath are often our most vulnerable. Equity considerations should be accounted for in planning and recovery, including in the pre-positioning of assets in anticipation of disaster. So I look forward to exploring these issues today with the distinguished group that we have brought together for our two panels. Panel one is going to examine firsthand accounts from public safety and communications industry stakeholders who respond to disasters. Panel two will explore steps to improve resiliency in our networks so communications remain available and accessible for all. So that's a lot of ground to cover. We're gonna get this program rolling. And uh, it's now my pleasure to turn over the floor to my colleagues to offer their thoughts. And we'll start with Commissioner Carr. Oh, thanks so much to the chair for convening this hearing. And thanks again for the invitation to join you uh, earlier down in Louisiana to see firsthand the impacts from Hurricane Ida. These are, these are so important. Earlier this summer, I had a chance to uh, to go with some of the officials from the Western Fire Chiefs Association uh, out to the Dixie Fire in California, which I think now is the classified as the, or at least was at the time, the single largest wildfire in state history. Uh, spent time with uh, Chief Zagiris, getting to meet with crews that were working the fire lines uh, during an active fire and hear from them about communications challenges that they were uh, they were facing. And so I very much look forward to hearing uh, from the panelists today. I agree with a lot of the areas of inquiry uh, that you laid out uh, in your opening statement. And for me, uh, it's pretty simple. You know, calls to 911 uh, have to go through. Uh, 911 service has to be the last connection to go out in a disaster situation. And I think there was a lot of very good progress uh, that needs to be acknowledged in terms of how the network performed during Hurricane Ida, particularly compared to past hurricanes. Um, at the same time, in my view, the status quo isn't acceptable. And so whether it is an update to the industry's uh, voluntary framework or additional regulation. Uh, something has to change and I'm comfortable uh, going either way at this point. So I really look forward to the feedback uh, that we get from the panelists today. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Carr. Commissioner Starks. Yes, uh, a brief thank you to the acting chair uh, and of course commission staff for organizing today's hearing on a mission critical topic, and that is disaster preparation, resiliency in our communications networks. Uh, as was uh, previewed and mentioned last month, we voted unanimously uh, to begin uh, that comprehensive inquiry on these urgent and important issues. I'm glad we're hearing testimony today from these experts who will help us learn even more from the recent emergencies and plan the commission's next step uh, to helping work uh, to keep Americans connected during emergencies and speeding the restoration of networks when danger has in fact passed. When I personally um, uh, last heard these issues, I, it was in a field hearing myself 
on the same topic in Puerto Rico in response to the hurricanes uh, Irma and Maria, as well as the earthquakes there. And I learned a tremendous amount on a personal, professional policy level. So I'm deeply interested in today's uh, dialogue, really. Preparing our communication networks to withstand disasters has never been more important. The consequences of climate change in particular are coming into sharper focus every season. Hurricane Ida, just the most recent of the serious storms to hit the United States this year, was the second most intense and damaging hurricane to ever make landfall in Louisiana. And so I, uh, I deeply applaud, applaud the efforts of the Louisiana Emergency Operations Center, working alongside federal partners on the ground and responding uh, to the storm. I also want to thank the many responders, of course, who worked tirelessly to restore networks after uh, the hurricane made landfall, as well as the Louisiana Association of Broadcasters for communicating unmet fuel, com communications, power needs of the state broadcasters to FCC personnel. Quick action by local, state, federal governments and cooperation with private actors undoubtedly saved lives. And so we recognize the dedicated work under such trying conditions. And at the same time, uh, we know in the storm's aftermath, many people were, of course, cut off from communications at a time of great anxiety and peril. And so I'm hoping that this hearing and the public comment process along with extensive investigation uh, conducted by our staff will lead to those concrete steps that we're all looking for to helping prevent outages when they occur and certainly getting Americans reconnected faster. So those steps are what I'm hoping to hear. They're an essential part of the commission's duty to protect public safety, uh, but they are also uh, critical to our digital equity uh, and inclusion work. Recent studies including one by the Environmental Protection Agency, highlight the disproportionate impact, again, climate change is having on vulnerable Americans, having and is already um, uh, impacting. These include people of color uh, and the low income, Americans who are disproportionately likely to find themselves on the wrong side of the digital divide, and they are counting on us to get this right. And so we will not have equal access to modern communications without improving network resiliency. So I look forward to hearing from the panelists, investing in re resiliency, how it can advance our shared digital equity goals. Uh, and so deeply look forward to um, your experience, your expertise, and um, uh, in, in, in talking. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to thank Acting Chairwoman Rosen Wurzel for calling a hearing on this very important topic, and thank you all for joining us today and offering your insight into how we can do better. I expect us to say a lot today about the need to make certain sure infrastructure more resilient to failure, even under the most extreme circumstances. This is important work, and I know the FCC, industry, and government at all levels can do a better job. But whatever is done to shore up critical infrastructure, there will nevertheless be future outages, and many of those outages will occur at the worst possible time in the midst or aftermath of a natural disaster. The failure of these systems needs to be treated as inevitable, not impossible. No one can expect public safety entities to operate as efficiently or effectively during an outage as they normally do, but the public does expect those important government entities whose fundamental purpose is to handle emergencies to be able to accomplish their most critical missions in the face of foreseeable problems, like the destruction of power and data lines by a hurricane. The public also expects that, in turn, industry and all levels of government are doing their part to support first responders in the careful planning, preparation, and execution required to mitigate the impact of outages. One way industry can help is by making sure that public safety entities have information about the resiliency and failure modes of the systems they rely on. This information is crucial for local and state governments that have to decide how to spend their limited budgets. It would be great if every power and data line could be put underground, if we could install multiple redundant generators at every cell tower and police station and PSAP, and if every city could operate multiple redundant radio systems and so forth, but that's not possible. Instead, local and state governments need to understand what systems are most likely to fail and how those failures might correlate with increased public need for emergency services and then plan accordingly. Capacity in an outage will never be 100%, but it should be higher in the most likely and critical scenarios than in the least likely and most banal. Governments themselves are often standing in the way of progress on these issues. Byzantine planning and environmental review processes can take years to navigate. It should not be more expensive and time consuming to secure government approval than to actually procure and install improvements that are obviously in the public interest. The FCC has acted in this area before and we should continue to look at what we can do to lift red tape and to shorten the timelines to secure approval for these important projects. 
Thank you all for your time, and I look very much forward to learning from your remarks. Uh, thank you, and let me do a little housekeeping by explaining that today's first panel is entitled Lessons from the Ground, and it will examine firsthand accounts from public safety and communications industry stakeholders responding to disasters with the goal of exploring what works, what doesn't, and what lessons we can learn from their experiences. I'm going to ask our panelists to turn on their videos at this time. I'm honored that we're joined by a group of dedicated public servants, first responders, and emergency response communications coordinators. Today, we are going to hear from Janet Britton, the General Counsel of Rev Broadband, a Louisiana-based telecommunications provider. Jeff Johnson, the Chief Executive for the Western Fire Chiefs Association. Holly Prince Johnson, the President and CEO of the Louisiana Association of Broadcasters. Francisco Sanchez, Jr., Deputy Homeland Security and Emergency Management Coordinator for Harris County Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. And Jack Bernardo, the Captain of Livingston Parish Sheriff's Office. And let me uh, offer a few more reminders. This event is open to the public via a live feed from the FCC's webpage and our YouTube channel. Stakeholders, members of the public are invited to share their perspectives on these topics in the form of written statements via filing with the commission's electronic comment filing system. And they should be filed in PS docket number 21-346 and 1580, as well as ET docket number 4-3. 35. Written statements of the panelists, the recording of the hearing will be made a part of the public record in these topics. Our lawyers also tell me that I need to say that the views communicated during this field hearing are not intended to reflect decisions on open issues before the agency, and we look forward to learning more as the commission develops a record in this open proceeding. I'd also ask our esteemed panelists to please mute themselves when not speaking or answering a commission prompted question. And also I ask that our commissioners explicitly address which witness or witnesses they'd like to hear from when we get to the question portion of today's hearing or otherwise specify that they're putting a question to the panel as a whole. And now we are finally going to proceed with opening remarks from today's first panel, followed by questioning from the commission. Uh, I'd like to request the panelists limit their remarks to roughly three minutes. And we will first hear from Janet Britton. Ms. Britton. Please take it away. Good morning. Uh, my name is Janet Britton. I'm general counsel of Rev Broadband, and Rev Broadband is the parent company of RTC, ETEL, and Vision Communications, three providers of advanced communication services in southeastern Louisiana. The combined company owns and operates almost 2,800 miles of fiber and has nearly 400 employees and 60,000 customers. With sustained winds at landfall of 150 miles per hour, Hurricane Ida ravaged a swath of Louisiana, ripping through communities that we serve for over eight decades. The devastation and continued recovery efforts have had a profound impact on the communities we serve in terms of housing, health care, connectivity, and employment. Many of our own employees remain displaced and are picking up the pieces scattered by Hurricane Ida. Even as our area continues to recover in the wake of this storm, we've already identified several lessons learned. One, support is needed to build resilient networks. Our Bayer facilities did well after Ida to provide critical services to multiple agencies and communities. The building of a more resilient network will need to come later after we tackle the immediate task of restoration. We ultimately will need support for building such resilient networks to weather the next storm. Two, be prepared to deal with disruptive su supply chains such as fuel. The breakdown of the supply chain for fuel was surprising because we had arrangement with local suppliers and a supplier outside of the area. The supply issue, fuel supply issue affected everyone in our communities, but the impact was significant for our recovery efforts relative to stand standby generators and fleet vehicles. Three, coordination with power companies is critical to avoid fiber cuts and disruption of service. We as communications provider, providers need help requiring the power companies to coordinate closely during restoration. Our recovery effort is hampered and active critical services to 911, EOCs, and first responders are put at risk when the power companies damage fiber and take down communications in the process of their own recovery efforts. Our electric utilities need to provide greater transparency to everyone, but especially to those companies that have critical infrastructure co-located with their distribution facilities. 
Number four, our communities need help. We're working seven days a week on restoration efforts, but we've taken interim steps to help communities get reconnected. Even as we rebuild, we've established eight community Wi-Fi locations in the hardest hit areas so that these communities can access the internet. We understand the importance of the services we provide. We also see the tremendous need in the communities we serve. There is a true humanitarian crisis for many related to housing and basic needs. With that in mind, we see the need to care for our communities through continued financial support of programs like the EBBP, and fifth and final, keep warnings and prepare for the worst. There's safety in getting out of the path. And if you stay, be prepared to be self-sufficient. Could Consider everything that could go wrong because it may. I very much appreciate the opportunity to address you here today and the visit to our area. Our communities are strong and we will rebuild together. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Britton. Now we turn the mic to Jeff Johnson. Thank, thank you, Acting Chairwoman Rosenworcel and members of the Commission uh, for allowing my testimony today. And also, I'd like to thank you individual commissioners for your engagement in public safety. Commissioner Carr, no one's been more relieved than when Chief Segaris brought you back uh, from that fire safe and sound. He has a tendency to want to get pretty close to the action, if you will. Uh, for the record today, uh, commissioners, when I talk about FirstNet, I'm talking about AT&T who's contracted to build the network itself. And then when I talk about the authority, I'm talking about FirstNet, the authority, who has the contract responsibility to hold the contractor accountable for performance and operation of the network. For the, uh, I think maybe where we start is to start with, this is the third year of building FirstNet. Well, the law was signed in February of 2012, the actual construction of the network began three years ago, and we are approaching 3 million connection, connections uh, to the network uh, today uh, with public safety agencies. Also, the network resiliency is an important issue, and I, I thank the Commission for taking up this issue, because it's not just for responders, as was mentioned. If the inbound 911 caller can't reach a PSAP, and the PSAP can't reach responders, where are we going? It, this network of being able to reach into public safety, then public safety having reliable broadband tools at their disposal as we uh, go outbound to handle the call is critical. And the cellular service is even more critical than ever. Over 81% of the calls to 911 are now coming via cell phone on a nationwide basis. There are many elements to resiliency. It starts at the radio access network and the tower. That's got to be standing and operational. The power grid and its reliability is critical. Uh, we contributed to the passage of an assembly bill in California that made permitting easier and more expeditious for approving backup power supplies on uh, critical infrastructure sites such as towers. Generators matter and fueling generators matter in the event that the uh, power grid goes down. And then backhaul, of course, because eventually it all ends up on fiber, which is subject to mechanical interruption and damage from hurricanes. And then finally, the last two components are the core and the key uh, components to the core, and then network security. All of these things must be healthy and survive whatever the event is in order for the network to be operable. And when I say when, not if a network fails, we have to look at it. These networks, no matter what your best intent is, they, they will eventually feel, fail. And public safety, our job is to minimize the number of times that happens, speed the pace at which that network is uh, restored, and then take a good hard look at what caused the failures and what caused the problems and make sure that those are fixed. As far as Hurricane Ida and the massive wildfires in the West are concerned, the, rest, the maintenance of an operating network and the restoration of the network is the priority. And that's why the dynamic deployment of mobile network tools such as cows and colts that are pre-positioned in anticipation of the emergency, so they can get in there and either supplement the network Mr. itself. Johnson, you have 30 seconds remaining. Thank you. They can supplement the network itself or backfill the network for operation. 
This network, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners, was inspired by the 9-11 Commission report, and that was 20 years ago. And I asked myself one simple question. Are we safer today as a result of the network that we put in place with FirstNet? And the answer to that is yes, but many lessons to learn and our ears are open to those lessons. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Polly Prince Johnson, the floor is yours for your opening remarks. And we unmute yourself, Ms. Johnson, please. Good morning, Acting Chairwomen and Commissioners. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you regarding lessons on the ground during natural disasters. Um, I'm Polly Prince Johnson and President and CEO of the Louisiana Association of Broadcasters. I first would like to thank Justin Kane with the FCC and Travis Johnson with GOSEP. They both helped me tremendously before and after Hurricane Ida. Uh, why was broadcast radio and TV so important during this time? With internet and cell service failing across a large portion of South Louisiana, TV and radio were the only means of broadcasting emergency information to a mass audience. Our stations became the sole information source and were utilized by the governor's office, parish OEPs, law enforcement, FEMA, and public utilities. Our employees lived at the stations so they could be there to help their viewers and listeners during Hurricane Ida, reporting even when they had sustained damage to their stations and their own homes. We raised millions of dollars in in-kind donations for the United Way, American Red Cross, and many more. We also had our own food and supply drives in every part of our state, and it continues to this day. Our radio and TV stations were instrumental in saving lives, from getting help to an assisted living community that had no power to helping families get out of flooded homes. As you are all aware, the telecommunications outages were significant, and with over a million customers without power, fuel was in short supply. Being that fuel was such a critical part in keeping our broadcasters on the air and informing the public, we feel this needs to be addressed. The gas stations that did have fuel would not accept the fuel letters issued by CISA. Can this be addressed for future storms? The timeline, August 27th, we received the tropical storm Ida debris and fuel letters. August 29th, Hurricane Ida hit. September 2nd, we received Hurricane Ida debris and fuel letters. On September 3rd, CISA industry partners received the revised information on how to get fuel in Louisiana. Because I was not on the list, the information wasn't received. I ask that in the future that those broadcast association that are in harm's way be included in the industry partner list. Without fuel, we are off the air. And if you haven't lived through a natural disaster, you are unaware of what it means to hear from your local leaders or listen to a familiar voice. I, for one, had no cell service for 24 hours, then it was spotty at best. I also had no internet or power for nine days. This is the reason broadcasters are on the air in times of emergencies. With cell service and internet companies down, I think that the commission needs to reevaluate uh, DERS. At 5.04 p.m. on Sunday, August 29th, I received an email from the FCC that had activated DARS. The hurricane had already made landfall five hours earlier. Our small locally owned broadcasters need to be able to secure SBA loans to help them recover. If the commission can let the SBA know that broadcasters are an important part of communicating with the public during natural disasters, that would be helpful. I am proud of what we do for our communities. I know that the commission recognizes what broadcasters do for the states that we serve. If we aren't there to inform them, who will? Big Tech, I appreciate your invitation to speak with this field hearing so I could shine a light on how important broadcasters are in their communities during disasters. Thank you, Ms. Prince Johnson. Next, we will hear from Francisco Sanchez. Uh, good morning, uh, Commissioners and Acting Chairwoman. I appreciate uh, the invitation to be on this panel, and, and, and thank you, uh, Chairwoman Rosen Russell, for calling the hearing on this critical topic uh, and your sharp focus uh, during your service to this, wireless emergency alerts, next gen 111, uh, and the other public safety issues that we face. Uh, while Harris County was not impacted by Hurricane Ida, uh, we've averaged, averaged a presidential level declared disaster every nine months since FEMA was created. Uh, that's the Gulf Coast. Uh, in just the last six years, we've experienced three major floods, including Hurricane Harvey, the second most costly disaster in our nation's history, 
uh, the first major industrial incident in 30 years, COVID-19, and now this year, historic winter storm URI. Communications is the linchpin of disasters. Uh, whether this is providing alerts and warnings to the public or maintaining the ability to hear from critical partners and stakeholders. We fail when our networks fail. Every moment emergency managers are unable to hear and be heard, lives are in jeopardy. At the Harris County Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Management, we've developed a strategy that prioritizes putting critical information where the public is accustomed to getting their news, whether it's traditional broadcast media, which is where people go during times of crisis, SMS or text messages or social media, our multi-channel communication strategy is the same on blue sky days as it is on gray sky days. By creating a cohesive brand and ways to get information, Ready Harris has become the go-to place for information on emergency preparedness, mitigation, disaster, response, and recovery. As an emergency management agency, our ability to have an impact to save lives and property is grounded in what we are able to learn from residents and especially our jurisdictions and our partners across various uh, uh, areas. Each day we poll our jurisdictions to create what we call a sweat report, security, water, energy, accessibility, and telecommunications. This is granular information allowing us to see the big picture, anticipate cascading impacts, and stay ahead of the curve. Their priorities become our priorities, but we cannot help them alone. The key element of emergency management response strategy is bringing together uh, uh, those critical partners inside of our emergency operations center together. This includes law enforcement, fire, transportation, utilities, public health, telecom, uh, hospitals, all those kinds of organizations that need to be together to facilitate secure, robust, and candid communications. That's the role of emergency management, and we help them understand the systematic interdependencies that are staying in our community. For example, we can help transportation departments prioritize clearing road debris so that power and telecom companies can reach down power lines, essentially helping them plan the restoration efforts. Power companies can prioritize restoring communications and connections to critical infrastructure such as water and sewer. This process eventually brings the entire community back online quicker. Cooperation and coordination introduces precision to the murkiness of a disaster post-disaster world. But it only happens when we can pull back the curtain and help everyone understand the multitude of complicated uh, structures we all depend on. And we've done this in countless disasters. There's a lot of commonalities between power and telecom providers. We're fortunate to have our FirstNet and other power supplier companies here during major incidents. But we need to do a better job of bringing together other telecom partners as well. We rarely have the full picture of regional telecommunications network, and that's unfortunate. We need to know more than that those are willing to share. What towers are down? Who do they service? How long will it take to bring them back online? Without knowing how bad bad really is, our ability, our ability to lead a unified response is radically compromised. We've Mr. created- says you have 30 seconds remaining. Sure. Uh, uh, you know, we've been able to do that for, for big events like Super Bowl, disasters, and thankfully now World Series, so go Astros. Um, communications is the single most important factor in determining whether our response to a disaster, where that's gonna fall in that wide prep spectrum between failure and success. And whether your business, government, or community, we're all highly dependent on telecommunications working. If that fails, we'll all fail. So just to close, you know, URI was the first major disaster since Hurricane Ike where Harris County power grid was compromised. As a result of that, we saw noticeable degradation in both cellular and data service and our ability to hear and be heard was severely jeopardized, even if temporarily. I'd like to extend my thanks to the FCC for your commitment to improving disaster communications across the country. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Sanchez. For our final witness on this panel, uh, an opening testimony, we will hear from Jack Bernardo. Good morning, Acting Chairwoman Rose Warsel, commissioners and other invited guests and commission staff. My name is J Captain Jack Bernardo, and I'm here to testify in my role with the Livingston Parish Sheriff's Office as commander of the communications division. I served in public safety communications since 1989. I oversee the operations of Livingston Parish's Emergency Communications Center and serve administratively as the Livingston Parish 911 director. I also serve on the board of directors of the Association of Public Safety Communications Officials, APCO, representing the Gulf Coast region. I also want to thank Livingston Parish Sheriff Jason Ord for allowing me to represent him in this hearing. 
Hurricane Ida began, began to affect Livingston Parish during the late night hours on August 29, when we learned that the dual 911 Annie and Alley circuits that provide critical location information and callback numbers of callers utilizing 911 was out of service. The degradation and loss of critical voice and 911 routing circuits will continue for the next couple of hours until all of our 911 system was down. Emergency reroutes were implemented to our administrative lines as per our pre plans so we could still get some 911 voice calls, mostly from wireless callers. It would be on August 31, around 5 p.m., before our 911 system would be restored. Additional outages over the next several days would occur due to generators running out of fuel and cable cuts while clearing roadways and down trees and debris. The challenge of losing our 911 network was extremely frustrating as we have dealt with this very same type of outage situation during Hurricane Katrina in 2005, again in Hurricane Gustav in 2008, and now again during Hurricane Ida. The real frustrations come with AT&T having done nothing, in my estimation, to harden or make these critical circuits more resilient to known hazards. I've been told by multiple AT&T representatives since Hurricane Katrina that significant portions of these cables are run in the air and not buried. I want to be clear, I'm not referencing lines or cables to houses and businesses or even feeder lines down rural roads. I'm referencing major carrier lines that directly support public safety communications. This critical infrastructure does not only service 911, but provides network facilities to FirstNet. I'll address those shortly. The only real improvement that I've witnessed since Hurricane Katrina is that two selective routers or tandems serving Southeast Louisiana were mirrored, but this does not make their network more hardened or resilient if emergency calls cannot get into or out of the selective routers to the local ECCs. We have also learned that several generators that power critical facilities, including wireless towers, were not refueled for varying reasons. How does this happen? This must be addressed for the future. Another challenge that was faced during Hurricane Ida was the loss of wireless service from FirstNet built by AT&T. The outages that FirstNet experienced were due at least in part to the failure of the AT&T landline network as referenced earlier. Our agency has assets to clear roadways and paths to these towers or other critical facilities, or even lend a fuel truck if needed. Better information and situational awareness may have helped. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate in this hearing and for your visit to our area. Please reference my written testimony for more in-depth comments. I welcome any questions you have and I'm happy to assist however I can with the commission's efforts to improve the reliability of our nation's emergency communications. Thank you, Captain Bernardo and all, all of our witnesses for showcasing their expertise, giving us their opinions and joining us today. We're now gonna try to do some brief questioning of our witnesses and I'm gonna kick things off. We'll try to keep our questions to five minutes each. Um, Mr. Sanchez said something I really liked, which was that communications is the linchpin of disaster. And nowhere is that more true than I think when it comes to 911. So uh, I'd like to ask our last witness, Captain Bernardo, a pretty basic question. How do 911 centers like yours learn when networks go down? Do you learn it in a consistent fashion? What more can be done to make sure you get timely and actionable information? I think at least in, in my history of, of dealing with outages that we've had, um, the notifications have become more regular and more timely, but I think there is still a lot of work to be done. We learn about those through uh, emails or if, uh, the, the telecom companies can get through a uh, voice call to us, but many times that voice call is down uh, during that time because of network failures or outages in, in some fashion. So uh, I think since Hurricane Katrina, we have seen an improvement of letting uh, us know when those outages occur, but I think there's still some work to be done there. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, next, I want to go to Ms. Britton from Rep broadband, you mentioned fiber cuts. It was an issue that came up a lot in uh, the aftermath of Hurricane Ida and the reality that inadvertent cutting of fiber as power is restored can lead to a whole range of secondary outages. This really highlights the need for coordination between telecommunications companies, public safety and our power companies. But I'd like you to talk a little bit about what you saw with fiber cuts and secondary outages if you could. 
So uh, we are still in the restoration effort and we are still seeing fiber cuts. So um, we have some on the ground folks and have attempted to coordinate and the power companies when, when we've raised the issue have provided a local contact. We just need more transparency to try to avoid those cuts because uh, customers who are, who are up and whether they're residential or business or critical infrastructure such as first responders, they have service and then suddenly they don't and they don't understand why. And so I think that this is an issue that happens storm after storm and disaster after disaster for us. And we we just very much would appreciate some assistance in that coordination and that transparency um, so that we can have crews on the ground with them so that they understand where our facilities are and the impact of what they're doing. Well, thank you. Um, I'll let me just move on a little bit with power and ask um, uh, Chief Johnson uh, from the Western Fire Chiefs Association. I know one of the interesting things about what's going on with the wildfires out west is we also have planned power outages to mitigate the threat of wildfires. And I'm wondering what kind of planning goes into those planned power outages and how does this affect thinking about backup power and public safety? Thank you, Acting Chair Rosenworcel. Uh, public safety power shutoffs are a reality in the West, primarily in California. Public safety has had to adjust our attitude about how long people are going to be out. Sometimes this isn't for hours, it's for days. Um, and in more than one case for over a week. Um, it's very critical that the uh, facilities that, that keep our communications alive, that they have backup power that lasts the duration it would be necessary not only for an unplanned emergency like this, but for a planned emergency. That requires that the state regulatory agency, the utility and public safety coordinate on exactly how this is gonna happen, what's gonna be affected, and to make sure that if we can supplement uh, any of the necessary infrastructure with power that we do what we can to do so. That's one of the primary reasons that we supported Assembly Bill 2421 in California, which was to make it easier to place backup power at all critical infrastructure sites. And I, I think anything we can do to reduce the regulation, I think one of the witnesses had mentioned that it can sometimes take longer to get per, through permitting than actually build the infrastructure. I find that to be consistent you with mean, my- Do you mean permitting for backup power? I just want to clarify. Uh, but both permitting for backup power and for permitting for the location of wireless facilities. Uh, Assembly Bill 2421 dealt specifically with backup power at existing facilities. All right. Thank you all for your uh, your answers. I, I want to make sure that my colleagues also get some time to ask some questions, especially the witnesses we haven't uh, I haven't yet been able to reach. So Commissioner Carr, why don't you take it away? Oh, well, thanks so much. Well, uh, first, a quick interlude. I know when we started this, uh, your title was acting chair, but if the news releases are to be believed, uh, I believe it is chair is your official title uh, at the moment. So congrats to you. I do think it's uh, very fitting and appropriate that it comes uh, while you're focused on public safety, which is something that you've you know marked as a very high priority for you. So if I can multitask, I'll get a statement out uh, shortly, but wanted to uh, interject that real quickly. Uh, congrats to you and the other uh, nominees, obviously. Uh, yeah, this is a very important topic to be sure. Um, and one thing I was interested in, particularly on the, the recovery side, Janet, was maybe touching some on um, some of the supply chain challenges, if you're facing those as part of the recovery, maybe sort of uh, speaking briefly about that. So during the height of the storm, we did have something that was very unexpected, and Polly mentioned it, in terms of the fuel shortage. And um, the the that was a, a real big eye opener for all of us in terms of our dependency on fuel and the fact that just really for the whole country, the, the path of Ida significantly affected um, fuel supply. Um, in terms of this telecom equipment and our restoration effort, prior to Hurricane Ida, we saw very long lead times. We had, uh, and, and this exacerbated that that problem that we're seeing. I actually asked in preparation, what are the lead time we're seeing related to fiber? And it may be nine or 12 months. And I've heard very 
much longer period. So while we're attempting to recover, we're having difficulty in securing some of the products just because of the tremendous demand and the interruption of the supply chain. So those are real Sorry, issues. You maybe touch this, but there are particular things that you're seeing in particular, I mean, I was talking about fuel, but, but some of the other products, I know, for instance, when I met with a uh, crew that was building out infrastructure outside of Miami, they said just, you know, the pickup trucks for the crews were, were difficult. So there's like, I would say it, there's telecom specific things that are short and there's sort of general challenges that impact, you know, you guys and, as well. Yes, and both of those are true. So the chip shortage impacts us in terms of our mm -hmm. electronics. Uh, the, um, just the demand. So we have lower supply and higher demand relative to say fiber and hooks and cables relative to all this construction that's going on because of the uh, broadband funding that's out there. And that's just real for us that there is a supply chain issue. So it's, it's making planning very, very challenging and execution challenging. Gotcha. And then uh, Chief, Johnson, uh, yeah, I appreciate the, the, the words about uh, Chief Zagaris. I got to say, when I spent time with him, you know, you're meeting these crews that are on 24-hour shifts uh, that are out there, you know, digging trenches to try to create fire breaks. And I, I do have to say, you know, Chief Zagaris is just a national treasure. You'd see these crews that were, you know, out there for 24 hours straight, and they would see him, they would just light up. You know, their morale would get boosted, their spirits would get lifted. Uh, I think it was, it was a great thing to sort of see uh, the feelings that the, the crews had, the respect they had for him. One question for you is, you know, when I was meeting with you all, you know, I met with some of the teams that were putting out the, the FM boosters uh, that was sort of the, the linchpin of the communications that you were using, putting them on, you know, uh, sites uh, across the fire area. But more generally, you touched on this with, with backup power. I mean, maybe sort of touch some more on, um, you know, the value of infrastructure and sort of the needs to, to streamline builds, particularly on federal lands, which obviously is an area where we see a lot of problems with forest fires. And it's an area that's been hard not for us to crack in terms of siting, particularly the FCC. And we've been able to make progress in some other areas that's more core within our jurisdiction, at least in, in my view. Uh, but, but federal lands has been a challenge. Well, thank you for the question, Commissioner. Uh, the, the fact is a lot of the most significant uh, national disasters that we're gonna have occur in rural America. They're hurricanes, they're wildfires, and that's the place we're least likely to have especially reliable broadband coverage and reliable redundant uh, backup service. It is true in wildfires. Uh, we've seen significant burnover in some of the wildfires out west where they're literally taking out every tower and every mountaintop for 20 miles. And then if you happen to have your uh, fiber optic lines for backhaul above ground, you obviously are gonna lose those and if you don't lose those to the fire, you're likely to use, lose those to the utility crews that are cutting the lines to open the roads. It is a significant problem. I do believe it would be helpful for all, ask, all, all elements of the federal government to open up their assets for the expansion of wireless and, and uh, public safety broadband coverage and infrastructure everywhere in the country. Uh, and at a minimum, have an expedited permitting process for the National Public Safety Broadband Network. We need assets, we need backhaul, we need mobile assets, and we need, frankly, a more streamlined way to get those things. Gotcha, thank you so much. I'll, I'll you, pass. Commissioner. All right, uh, Commissioner Starks for your questions. Yes, uh, well, I will echo those comments. Uh, it has been released from the White House. So uh, congratulations, uh, uh, acting chair on your nomination. Uh, so um, we'll, we'll move along. Uh, Mr. Francisco Sanchez, uh, it, you know, interested in, in the kind of repeat, uh, you were talking about how Hurricane Ida wasn't a, a particular uh, recent source, but you've seen a number of times here. So interested in kind of your holistic experience, you know, is there enough backup capacity you think there in Harris County? And, and, you know, we know the deployment of mobile resources like mobile generators and, and colts and cows is a major part of carrier's response strategy. So interested in, uh, are there enough of those assets available? And then I'll, uh, I heard you also mention uh, colts and cows as well. Uh, Chief, Chief Johnson, if, if you could um, also take take a crack at that. 
Sure. I, I think in terms when it comes to uh, uh, to the availability of those resources that can be surged into an area, I think we need to do a reassessment. Uh, events are more catastrophic. They're more frequent. And quite frankly, we're seeing forecasts that continue to pan out. I think, you know, someone called me during Hurricane Harvey and said this was a once in a lifetime event. Someone called me during uh, uh, Tropical Storm Uri and said this is a once in a lifetime event. Someone called me during the pandemic and said this is the once in a lifetime event. Uh, uh, that's a lot of lifetimes in 49 years. Um, but we're gonna see that continue to happen. Um, and one of the consistent things that I've seen and heard from partners across the board, not just telecom, but just everyone, is man, I didn't expect that. But the forecast for each of those have said that. Yeah. Uh, and we have this trouble grasping the magnitude of what's happening because they're, they're, they're just getting more bigger, more catastrophic, and the forecast are dynamically like becoming exponentially worse. We need to have that culture change and being able to staff up, stock up, and be prepared for those. And we need to step up our game when it comes to resources. The general observations uh, during a crisis is resources are scarce and information is dynamic. Um, and we can overcome those in multiple ways. One, I think uh, we need to, in terms of where we maximize those scarce resources in our communities to have the most impact, to have them where critical infrastructure is is needed to keep television going, to keep you know, uh, 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 first net going, to keep those alerts and warnings going, to make sure that we focus on DEI and where we need to have those gaps is information sharing. And that's where the information needs to be. We need to change the model of doing business uh, uh, from need to know to need to share. Uh, it used to be that if I knew something, uh, I assumed I needed to know it and you would get it elsewhere. And one of the challenges, and this isn't just on telecom, but I find across utility partners, power, telecom, uh, cable, and other folks is a lot of this information they consider proprietary. Um, and it becomes challenging where we're trying to get an accurate picture on the ground. Uh, we have no interest in, in, in the proprietary information for any sake other than how do we identify those interdependencies here in our emergency operations center, if they can share that information so we can stop those cascading impacts um, that Ms. Britton was talking about. So, you know, we were, we're in here in the same room, things move in the emergency operations center at the speed of trust. And we can build those trusts with our partners and they come in part of the emergency operations center and share that information that normally would not share. That helps us minimize those cascading impacts. Yeah, Commissioner, um, great question. Um, as it relates to cows, colts, mobile resources, I think the answer very simply is more. Mm -hmm. I think the First Net Authority recognized that when one of the very first reinvestment decisions they made, they uh, bought more cows and colts. And I don't think we're done yet. I think, as was just referenced, the magnitude of these events is getting more severe, more widespread, drawing more and more resources, literally picking up massive amounts of mobile resources, moving them from wildfires in the West uh it, it down into the gulf region to deal with a hurricane only to move on from there so i think the short answer is more and i don't think we just put that on uh first net uh, the first net authority i think uh us as chiefs every one of us on this call today probably have our own communications network and that may be in land mobile radio maybe high speed broadband maybe who knows what we have but we have access to our own infrastructure. I think we also have to take a look at creating our own resiliency using things like compact rapid deployables. Uh, Rescue 42, a Chico-based company, makes these devices you can literally put in your receiver hitch and create a cellular network that covers uh, enough of an area to have a functional incident command post anywhere in the country via satellite and into the National Public Safety Network. So I tend to look at that and I said, well, there's some responsibilities that belong with FirstNet Authority, some with FirstNet, but also I as a chief, how helpful would it be if every chief in the country that had infrastructure also had the capabilities that a compact rapid deployable provides? Fully integrated into the network, happens automatically, and I think we'll see more and more chiefs adopting those types of approaches to contribute to the overall problem. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Polly Prince Johnson, uh, thank you for sharing your experience with us. You know, you mentioned, of course, some of the great reporting done by stations across uh, Southern Louisiana there during the time when, uh, empl uh, when employees were also dealing personally with the storm's impact. Uh, and given how much news crews rely on, of course, mobile communications for the reporting, I have to imagine 
widespread wireless and broadband outages made their jobs even harder. But really, I just wanted to, to kick it over to you. Could you share with us some examples of how you saw and heard of reporting teams that kind of made it work? Uh, if you can enlighten us a little bit. Well, I, the, the communications part was very difficult um, because we have the little backpacks and we go out to and report from there. And when the networks are down, you can't get that information. So we were having to use satellites, um, mm -hmm. which, which was very important. And we had that as the backup. Um, our main concern really was not having the fuel to get into the vehicles, to get to the devastated areas, to try to get help down to the people in, in the bayous. So um, our, our biggest problem um, in, for this storm particularly was fuel and the access to fuel because we, as Janet had, backup of backup of how to get fuel, but because the fuel just wasn't there, there was lack of, and your CISA letters didn't work, that was our problem. Um, it, just to be able to have power to to keep the station going and and that was that was the, our biggest issue well, last question by me uh, uh, hopefully a, a relatively quick hit uh, although it's obviously something we need to unpack on a lot of these uh, for you uh, mr jeff johnson again you know the wireless network resiliency cooperative framework uh, only activates when of course two conditions are met the activation of the fcc's durs reporting system and then fema's emergency support function you know, but my interest is kind of as a practical matter, this, you know, really means the framework is own, it isn't always operational in response in particular to wildfires. You know, do, for, from your perspective, do you think we should be rethinking that changes to that criteria? Does it seem to be working? What, what, what's your, um, uh, again, I know I'm almost probably, probably already out of time, but interested in your quick, uh, your quick response. One thing public safety does very well is we get together after an event and decide what could be better and make immediate changes. Some of them take longer. I think anything that we can identify like this that can be strengthened, first net authorities wide open to hear it. So I think these are healthy conversations to have. And I think if we have clear thoughts on what can be better or strengthened, we say it. And we put it on the table of the agency responsible to make sure that the first net network performs according to contract and serves public safety at the end of the day. So I would say if if there's a possibility it could be better, let's surface it. Great, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Stark. So now Commissioner Symington, uh, please take it away with your questions. Thank you very much. Um, Chief Johnson, could you please tell us uh, about specific obstacles to deployment of broadband on federal lands and and uh, advise us on what laws and public bodies stand in the way so that the FCC knows what it can do to help. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm not going to be very good at articulating the specific areas of federal uh, law that need to be changed. There's, there's people far smarter than me that can do that. What I can say is, is that if you, especially in the West, where there is so much public land, Oregon is about 52% public land, Nevada runs over 70%, California, et cetera, et cetera. With that much public land, we're talking about Department of Interior, Department of Agriculture. We're talking about wilderness policies. We're talking about anything that is publicly owned. Having a fast track system for the National Public Safety Broadband Network to deploy infrastructure, that is different than, uh, than, than the traditional approach. I think that would be wise public policy uh, because if you, if you look at it, you say, well, maybe we need to be extra careful for this reason or that reason. It's hard to imagine any of those reasons being as devastating as the kind of damage that comes from a wildfire that sweeps through the area and completely decimates it. I think we have to get better uh, at balancing what, what happens over here in terms of process and what we potentially gain, and over here, the damage that comes from not acting quickly. Thanks very much. Um, so uh, that's that's really appreciated, Chief. Uh, my next question is for um, is for Mr. Sanchez and also for Captain uh, Bernardo. And I hope I'm saying everyone's name correctly. 
Um, we want to minimize outages, but assuming that some outages will always occur, do you think government can have better contingency plans for continuity of service? I think it's inevitable that it'll be outages. I think, uh, look, I, I'll tell you, the uh, uh, I have yet to see any plan fully survive its encounter with reality. <laughs> um, and, and, and if they're done in, in rooms like this where the, the skies are fine, we've got plenty of coffee, we can talk through stuff and, and work it out. Uh, but but the, I would say the most important part of the plan is page one that tells you what the problem you're trying to fix is, and the last page that tells you what you would like that outcome to be. Everything in the middle is a menu, and some of those menu options are going to be taken off the table. Um, in terms of uh, the government responsibility, I think we've heard a lot really here about the interdependencies. We can plan as much as we can from the government side, um, but it really needs to be how do we bring all these partners to the table in a more active way. Um, we do that a lot with fire, law enforcement, public health. We do it a lot with power. Um, and just as a general observation and not quantified, but I don't think we do it with telecom enough. Um, uh, and I think I've seen that increasing gap have more uh, more consequences in recent years. Um, and I don't. It's not that there's an unwillingness there to do it. it, it folks have been responsive, uh, but I think it's a matter of resource and planning and commitment to do that. So can we do better? Yes, it's a planning process that will inevitably lead to, to more outages. But the more folks we have involved in that planning process, in our emergency operations centers, from the telecom side, and as a part of that cycle, um, the better off we're going to be in minimizing what those uh, what those outages are going to be, and increasing the time to restore that. Commissioner, I I, I totally agree with Mr. Sanchez's uh, viewpoint there, and and all of his comments. And I would say that as we move into next generation 911, I think it's going to be even more incumbent on the, the emergency communication centers to have that involvement with the telecom industry uh, to find out what our weaknesses are, where they're at, because they're not just going to be the, the type of, of damages from uh, hurricane or wildfire. We're talking about possibly um, uh, network failures from within inside the network because of security issues. So I think that, that developing that, um, that relationship now uh, with our telecom industry is going to be even more incumbent on us at the local level uh, as 911 is, is in Louisiana more of a local issue than it is state or, or federal, but, but having that, that from that standpoint. So thank you for the question. Thank you. All right, you're done, Commissioner Simonton? I am. All right. So I want to say thank you, my colleagues, for their thoughtful questions. Um, thank you to our panelists for their thoughtful responses, their willingness to join us today. And um, I just want you to know we're grateful. And uh, we may be following up with more questions as we mull over the things you put before us this morning. And with that, that concludes panel number one, Lessons on the Ground. And I am going to give my colleagues a brief recess before we start panel number two so they can get up and stretch their legs, walk around. Panel number two is titled Building Resiliency into U.S. Networks. We will gather here together at 1220 for that. Thank you. Congratulations, Chair. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Yes, congratulations. Congratulations. Welcome back to today's virtual field hearing focused on improving the resiliency and recovery of communications networks during disasters and exploring the lessons learned from Hurricane Ida and other recent disasters. Witnesses for today's second panel should now turn on their cameras. Our second panel is entitled Building Resiliency into U.S. Networks, and it will explore steps that have been, could be, or should be taken to build resiliency into networks to improve their availability and accessibility for affected communities. I'm really honored that we are joined by a diverse group of experts for this panel. And today we will learn and hear from Scott Bergman, Senior Vice President for Regulatory Affairs at CTIA, the Wireless Association, Donald Cravens Jr., the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the National Urban League. Louis Dabdow, the third director of incident response at Energy, 
and Harold Feld, Senior Vice President of Public Knowledge, as well as Linda Mastandrea, the Director of the Office of Disability Integration and Coordination at FEMA. And so here's where I go through a few housekeeping reminders. Before we continue with today's second panel, I'm just gonna recap. This event is open to the public via a live feed from the FCC's webpage and the FCC's YouTube channel. Stakeholders and members of the public are invited to share their perspectives on these topics in the form of written statements via a filing with the Commission's electronic comment filing system. And that's in PS docket number 21-346 and 15-80, as well as ET docket number 4-35. Written statements of the panelists and the recording of the hearing are going to be made a part of the public record in these dockets. And as we noted at the top, the views communicated during this field hearing are not intended to reflect decisions on open issues before the agency. And we look forward to learning more as the commission develops a record in the open proceeding. I'd also ask our esteemed panelists to please mute themselves when not speaking or answering a commission prompted question. And also, I want to ask the commissioners explicitly address which witness or witnesses they'd like to hear from when we arrive to the questioning portion of today's hearing, or otherwise specify that they're putting the question to the panel as a whole. And with that, we're going to proceed to uh, hearing from our second panel. I'd like to request that our panelists limit their opening remarks to roughly three minutes. And we will first hear from Scott Bergman. Please unmute yourself, Scott. Thank you, Mr. Berkman. Chairman Rosenworcel, uh, first let me congratulate you on your historic designation and nomination. If memory serves, your first public speech as a commissioner was on public safety issues, and so it's really appropriate that we're here today. So with that, Chairwoman and commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to testify and share the wireless industry's commitment to resilient networks, service continuity, and rapid restoration in the face of increasing emergencies and disasters. CTIA and our member companies are proud of the central role that wireless plays in our lives, especially during emergencies. We know that Americans rely on wireless, especially in their times of need. When emergencies threaten our communities, public safety sends wireless emergency alerts that spur us to action. And when disaster strikes, we reach for our wireless devices to find up to the minute information that can lead us to safety and help us recover. Unfortunately, with the effects of climate change, disaster events are increasing in both severity and frequency, causing widespread destruction. Those challenges are compounded when infrastructure is affected, causing power outages, loss of heating and air, and restrictions on drinking water. To be ready for this new landscape, the wireless industry is making investments that are resulting in more resilient networks. Three pillars of wireless resiliency and restoration have enabled our industry's strong response to Hurricane Ida and other disaster events and will help us respond to whatever comes next. First, investment and resiliency by design. And this includes densifying networks with overlapping cell sites and other upgrades totaling nearly $140 billion over the past five years. Second, preparedness and response, which involves pre-positioning both personnel and deployable equipment. And third, coordination and collaboration with other communications providers, electric utilities, and federal and state emergency managers. The Wireless Resiliency Cooperative Framework is part of that equation. Each disaster is different and requires boots on the ground assessments and challenging conditions. And the framework provides a meaningful and flexible array of tools to help us coordinate and speed recovery. As the first panel detailed, Hurricane Ida presented historic conditions. Uh, it left over a million people without electricity, some for weeks. I'm proud to report that wireless infrastructure in the Gulf proved remarkably resilient. And our planning and response teams work tirelessly to get service up and running as quickly as possible where it was knocked out. They worked in advance to ready backup power resources and stage an array of equipment, cows, colts, temporary backhaul, portable generators, just outside the impact zone. And once Ida passed, they were among the first on the ground, braving dangerous post-storm conditions, using airboats, launching drones to help quickly assess and respond. Uh, Ida's forces were undeniably devastating, but wireless restoration was impressive. More than half of the cell sites knocked out were back up within 48 hours, and more than 95% of cell sites in Louisiana were running by September 7th. These statistics don't diminish the frustrating and threatening experiences that consumers suffer. 
but they help highlight how the wireless industry's approach has enabled providers to effectively prepare and respond. Together, we're stronger than we were just a few years ago, and we continue to draw lessons from each event that strengthen our networks and our response. Blue sky conversations like this make all the difference in our times of need, and so we welcome the opportunity for further dialogue, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Bergman. Now we are going to turn the mic to Don Cravens. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you to the FCC and congratulations and thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for choosing to hold this hearing and inviting the National Urban League to testify. As a civil rights and urban advocacy organization, the National Urban League is dedicated to economic empowerment, equity, and social justice for African Americans, but for all Americans who live in underserved communities. We have 91 affiliates in 37 states, including the District of Columbia, and we serve nearly 2 million people annually through our direct services. Equity in disaster recovery is an important part of the mission that we do because we know that based upon these, national, these natural disasters, people of color are disproportionately impacted uh, by these disasters. Also, the National Urban League President and CEO, Mark Morial, former mayor of New Orleans, and myself, Don Cravens. We are native Louisianians, and so this topic is very near and dear to us. To us. For many Louisianians, Hurricane Ida stirred up strong emotions and memories. It hit exactly 16 years to the day of Hurricane Katrina. Immediately following the storm, the National Urban League urged state and local officials in Louisiana, as well as in New Jersey and New York, to, to not repeat the sins of the past, the sins of Katrina. We call on leaders to distribute available funding on a more equitable basis than we saw during Hurricane Katrina. African-American and underserved communities deserve better. As noted by the Commission's Resiliency NPRM, Hurricane Ida had significant physical impacts on both power and communications infrastructure. It is difficult to overstate the importance of modern communications networks for communities of color. As African-Americans and Hispanic households, we're more likely to rely on wireless as our primary broadband connection. So this means that during an emergency, Madam Chair, we're relying on wireless to check in with loved ones, to call emergency services, as well as to receive emergency text. During Hurricane Ida, there were encouraging signs due to the investment of wireless providers and their recovery efforts. Most wireless cell sites, as, as, as Scott mentioned, were up and running long before electrical power was restored to residents. However, improving the current framework should remain a focus of this commission. We share the longstanding concerns of you, Madam Chair, and the other commissioners on the need for better collaboration, more outreach, and greater investment in the recovery efforts across stakeholders. Along with the commission, the National Urban League suggests that providers take a multifaceted approach to disaster readiness and response with the aim of improving the public safety during natural disasters and continue to address gaps in the framework's coverage and implementation. Working with the FCC, wireless as well as, well as wired providers and power companies, we, we can take steps to reduce the number of outages and to speed up the recovery efforts. I again thank the commission for including me in today's virtual field hearing, and I commend the commission's commitment to advancing public safety and strengthening the resiliency of our nation's communications networks. Thank you, Mr. Cravens. And now we will turn to Louis Dowd. The floor is open for your remarks. Good afternoon, and thank you very much. And also, congratulations, Sherwin, on the nomination. Thank you, uh, everyone. Um, from an entry perspective, I want to focus on a couple of uh, key points. Safety for our personnel, support and restoration efforts is of the utmost importance. And this extends to other critical infrastructure and restoration workers as well. First responders and many others that take part in bringing back communities back following a major storm. Following last year's hurricane activity, we recognize an opportunity for improved collaboration with telecommunications companies around hurricane planning and restoration to minimize potential the loss of communications. We understand that fiber optic lines are, if, or if uh, fiber optic lines are severed, a loss of communications can result. And we understand by better coordinating with our telecommunication partners that we'll also, we'll also conduct an observation work that together we can help support one another in that effort. Energy is also an electric power industry participant in the Cross Sector Resilience Forum, which was created in 2020 in partnership with the major communication industry association like CTIA to identify opportunities needed to enhance communication and coordination 
between the communication and electric sectors before, during, and after a disaster. Energy has taken proactive steps to refine its restoration efforts from previous storms. In this regard, they continue to evolve and improve today. Following the 2020 hurricane season, we began working alongside Edison Electric Institute to align with their other member utilities who may have also shared similar restoration challenges, and we developed a unified plan of action. This has proven to be a highly valuable exercise. We adapted our storm readiness plan to better align personnel and reinforce training. We uh, designated a group which was named the Communications Deputy Section, which we established in charge of planning and coordinating with a number of communication companies prior to, during, and following the storm. Uh, leading up to 2021 hurricane season, we incorporated this topic along with personal with new responsibilities into our annual storm drills, emphasizing the importance of maintaining the integrity of telecommunications equipment in the field. The new section was activated during the 2021 hurricane season, including our response to Hurricane Ida. Representatives from the telecommunication companies took part alongside our team during the restoration efforts in the field and during planning meetings. Company and contracting crews as part of their onboarding were trained to not inadvertently cut any fiber optic wires without proper notification, barring an emergency. This training was reinforced during crew briefings and restoration personnel deployed into the field to restore power. Coaching was an ongoing action we took and as, and as additionally needed. In the field, we helped to reduce the risk of cutting in the telecommunication, telecommunication cables in the ground by using a hydrovac system wherever possible to set new poles instead of an auger. This process significantly reduced the likelihood of damaging those essential pieces of telecommunications infrastructure. We acknowledge that this is an important and continuous endeavor and stand committed to work with our other in-depth and critical infrastructure restoration workers, such as the telecommunications companies within our storm impacted areas. As mentioned, this collaboration has proven to be valuable. We've made significant improvements over the previous hurricane seasons and strengthened this part of our restoration work. Thank you for your time and ability to communicate today. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dabdow. Next, we will hear from Carol Spells. Uh, Chairwoman Rosenworth, so first let me join with everyone else in congratulations. You've been a champion of public safety long before it was cool, and I'm uh, looking forward to uh, uh, what your uh, FCC uh, has to offer. Uh, we have a systemic problem. In 2019, at the height of the California wildfire season, California's power utility, PG&E, advised the public that they could find out when power would be restored by visiting their website. And if their power was already out, they should use a landline to call a relative or friend who could give them the information from their web page. Apparently, PG&E were unaware that even if people have landlines, modern networks are not self-powered. This anecdote illustrates a number of points I want to touch on. First is the vital importance of power to the modern communications grid at every stage. This includes not only power to cell towers, but power in the home. Second, this story underscores the changing ways in which we communicate in a crisis. Local governments and first responders use and often hear from consumers through the internet during disasters, including through video and audio. Finally, this story shows how slowly we have adjusted to these new realities. Our mentality around network resilience remains mired in the analog age. We are still struggling to address backup power to cell towers, an issue identified by the FCC 15 years ago, and we have done virtually nothing on backup power in the home. We need a fundamental change of mindset for the modern world. At the moment, each player in the communications environment is on its own, responsible for its own network hardening and response. The current wireless communications framework makes mutual aid and assistance a matter of last resort. The attitude continues to be, everyone is on their own. But one of the great strengths of our modern communications network is its redundancy. Rather than one wireline network hardened to maximum reliability, we have multiple networks that interconnect and interoperate with each other. Sorry, I had a, yeah. Ideally, coordination and mutual assistance would begin before the disaster hits so that we can minimize the interruptions to vital communications throughout the crisis. States and federal governments frequently declare a state of emergency before a disaster hits so that emergency preparations can begin. Ideally, we would use the same triggers and should continue until the FCC shuts down DIRS. 
changing the current culture from every network for itself to we're all in this together will take time. It will take participation by industry and government at all levels to make our networks more resilient in the face of increasingly violent weather events. I have listed recommendations in my written testimony, but I particularly want to stress the importance of mandatory roaming agreements for all mobile carriers on a bill and keep basis as the most urgent and easiest change now that we are sunsetting our 3G networks and all carriers will use the same standards. I also want to stress the importance of making NORS data available to the public so the market can reward networks that invest in resiliency. Finally, I want to thank the chair for including consumer advocates in these discussions about network resiliency. Often these discussions focus on the cost to carriers of the resiliency measures, but consumers pay far more and all at once if they can't access communications during the crisis. And of course, consumers pay when carriers need to rebuild networks because they fail to properly maintain them or fail to harden them in the face of global climate change. As we can see today, the price of inaction is already too high. Thank you, and I am happy to answer any further questions. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Feld. And for our final witness opening testimony, we're going to hear from Linda Mastrandrea. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. I appreciate the, efforts, the opportunity. I'd like to thank the FCC for hosting this hearing today so that we can really speak frankly about the importance of strengthening the availability and accessibility of emergency information. To have a healthy and inclusive communications network, it has to be resilient technologically and geographically to maximize reach and ensure accessibility for all. FEMA is committed to the equitable delivery of programs and services to assist everyone who is or could be affected by disasters and emergencies, whether it's the ongoing COVID-19 response, wildfires in the West, hurricanes in the East, or record-breaking flooding nationwide, we're on the ground in communities across the country helping everyone, including those with disabilities and others who've traditionally been underserved. As the frequency and intensity of storms and other weather-related events increases with climate change, underserved communities are disproportionately impacted and people with disabilities face even greater challenges during response and recovery. Providing equitable services to people with disabilities requires ongoing consideration and effort. I'd like to share a few examples of how we've considered equity and accessibility during disasters. FEMA has expanded its reach in assistive communications through IPAWS, the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System. IPAWS is FEMA's national, assist, national system for local alerts, providing authenticated emergency and life-saving information to the public through mobile phones. IPAWS uses the common alerting protocol, which allows alerts sent through the system to transport multimedia attachments and links. Local alerting authorities can then use this information to develop content for compatible devices. This allows not only everyone, but in particular people who are deaf, hard of hearing, blind, or folks who have low vision to receive valuable and vital emergency alerts and information. Addressing equity and disaster preparedness and response also means improving access to information. Over the past year, we've increased the use of video phones to facilitate communication for the deaf and hard of hearing community, and we've provided live translations by a telephone service to facilitate other language access as well. We're proud of these practices, but we know there's more to do. One of the most important preparedness steps we can take is planning alongside underrepresented and higher risk groups, including people with disabilities. FEMA has a whole of community plan that includes the creation of strategic partnerships, the innovative use of data analytics, and ensuring our disaster messaging operations facilitate equitable access to information. No matter how advanced our technology is, as a society, we will always accomplish more by working together. Ongoing engagement between people with disabilities and community leaders and groups is vital. I wanna thank you all for the opportunity to speak on this today, and I look forward to continuing to engage in these discussions in the future. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, and thank you to all of our witnesses for showcasing their expertise joining us today. Um, we're gonna start with uh, some brief questions. And I will kick it off. Uh, we've heard a lot about the wireless resiliency framework today. 
which is a framework for mutual aid and roaming between our wireless carriers that was developed, I believe, in the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy nearly a decade ago. And so I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Bergman and Mr. Feld if you could just quickly tell me some thoughts about how we can improve that framework going forward so that it uh, works more smoothly and services restored more rapidly. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman Rosenworcel. Uh, you know, as I mentioned in my testimony, we're extremely proud of wireless performance in Hurricane Ida, and, and that was significantly, I think, informed by the use of the wireless resiliency cooperative framework. It creates the right incentives for investment, and I talked a little bit about how the build out of wireless towers helps with densification um, so that when one site goes out, it doesn't necessarily mean that we lose service. It helps with region specific choices so that we can target um, particular network approaches to areas that are prone to flooding uh, or areas that are prone to wind by choosing steel versus wood. Uh, and then the framework um, plays a key role in those times of most urgent need by um, making sure that we're um, coordinating with consumers, um, that we are making information available to the public, and then that we're having the right frameworks in place for mutual aid and, and roaming under disasters. Um, as we look at how to improve that, um, you know, we certainly look after each storm to see where can we go more quickly, where can we make things more seamlessly. But I, I think the the statistics and the experience of Hurricane Ida show that the flexible approach that we have is working very, very effectively. Mr. Fell. So um, the biggest thing I think we need to do is to not have a wireless communications framework, but a communications framework. As we heard time and again in the first panel, all of the pieces of our modern communications network are interrelated with each other. Uh, we can't uh, view this as just a silos anymore. Uh, at the same time, there are some things we can do while we're expanding out the framework. I think we, the framework should be mandatory for wireless carriers at this point. We have a number of years of experience with it. Uh, I think that uh, it should be voluntary for other members of the communications ecosystem as an initial matter, but mandatory uh, for uh, uh, wireless carriers and uh, as uh, others have mentioned, the triggering events for this should not be uh, the uh, uh, when a network goes down and then only as a last resort um, is mutual aid uh, extended, but we should formalize what is now going on informally uh, and have coordination in advance, advanced trainings and a triggering event such as a declaration of uh, an emergency um, that automatically you know, brings mutual aid uh, and uh, mutual coordination into play. All right, uh, moving along. Mr. Cravens, I um, appreciate that you're joining us here to talk about equity and recovery. Uh, so from your perspective, tell me what are the most impactful things that we could be doing at the FCC to ensure more equitable response and recovery of communications? Thank you, Madam Chair. So first of all, what you're doing today, Madam Chair, make, means a, makes a big difference. It means a lot. The fact that you're bringing attention to these issues and using an equity lens, it matters. It's intentional. The, the only way we, we as a country will become more equitable is to have intentional thought uh, on, on these issues. Um, what we are seeing, and, and I know Commissioner Starks mentioned this in his, his, his opening testimony, is that even the EPA, and, and we're starting to realize and study that our, our disasters have a disproportionate impact on on poor people and on urban communities we don't have the same resiliency structures in place to protect us when these things happen so looking at us as a victim an equitable victim is important madam chair but i also want you to look at us as not just a charity case but there also has to be equity in the the economy of the recovery we can't look at black and brown and women-owned businesses as victims of disaster and not companies we can use to help us build stronger. And so I'm asking the commission not only to have hearings on, on building stronger networks and, and how do we protect communities after the storm, but how before the storm can we partner with diverse suppliers? Um, are our companies working with diverse businesses to build resiliency? Um, Ms. Linda talked about, um, about having stakeholders at the table. 
let's have the stakeholders at the table as you are building a better network for our communities talk to us about our communities talk to us about our communities talk to our businesses about the communities can we do some of this work to build a more resilient uh, network a more resilient communication system so i think it's attention and i think it's intentionality and i think it's seeing urban and underserved people both as as as, as victims of this but also as seeing them with opportunity that they can also build as well and, and, and get jobs in these industries and, and make it more resilient. Thank you, Mr. Cravens. Uh, I'm gonna try to keep to my uh, five minutes here uh, and invite my colleagues now to ask some questions, starting with Commissioner Carr. Yeah, thanks so much to the chair. Um, you know, we've obviously seen sort of a big increase in wireless uh, build over the last couple of years. I know there's you know statistics that talk about in the last two years, seeing more um, infrastructure builds on this front than we saw in the past like seven years or so combined. Uh, maybe Scott, can you talk a little bit about some of those builds and you know, your views on whether that's helped to, to bolster uh, resiliency in, in, in circumstances like this? Thank you for the question, Commissioner. And, and uh, you're absolutely right. The steps that the commission and states have taken to uh, modernize uh, the setting process is undeniably helping strengthen our resiliency. Um, at, you know, you, you mentioned at a, at a macro level, I, I know that one of our nationwide providers reported that it had worked under the new rules to get nearly 13,000 sites uh, approved in 2020 compared to under 2000 in 2019. And that speed is helping make our network stronger because it means that when one site goes out, we can turn up neighboring sites and increase the power at frequencies. And that helps make sure the consumers can get access to the service when they need it. Gosh, I think when we look at, you know, some of the roaming issues, and when, when I was down there with the chair, you know, obviously there's, there's, there's puts and takes here. On the one hand, you know, I heard, um, concerns that some of the roaming was more delayed than what some public safety officials would want. Um, you know, I take the concern about, um, you know, we don't necessarily want to have automatic triggers and circumstances in which it's going to result either in overwhelming the existing network that's there or, you know, creating disincentives for investment. Although I'm a little bit skeptical whether long run we're going to see less investment because of automatic roaming, I think sort of commercial factors would drive it more. But maybe from your perspective, you talk a little bit about um, you know, some of the challenges um, in terms of sort of spelling this stuff out in more regulatory terms. And I guess from your perspective, the value of the, the flexibility that we currently have. I mean, again, we're seeing, you know, I understand there are puts and takes to this issue. Yeah, thanks for coming back to it. Um, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. Roaming under disaster is an important tool in the in the toolbox, um, and you know we understand that multiple roaming under disaster agreements were engaged during IDA. Um, I, I think one of your prior panelists talked about um, uh, planning, knowing the goal, and everything in the middle being a menu. I thought that was really sage counsel because you have to be ready to respond to what happens on the ground. And it's important to keep in mind that, that roaming under disasters is not like flipping a switch. The requesting provider needs to assess their network, um, not on a screen, uh, just on a screen, but in the field, right? Going out into those hazardous conditions by airboat, via drone, see what the status of their network is. And the host provider needs to do the same thing uh, because you know they, they wanna take into a, account overload. Uh, just like United doesn't plan for all of American and Southwest passengers to immediately go on its planes, we need to make sure that as we implement those provisions, we do it in a way that is going to maximize the benefit for consumers. And so you know, we were pleased to see multiple agreements engaged for IDA. We also know that we want to continue to improve. So well, we want to continue to look at whether the things that we can do to make that process work even more quickly for consumers. Gotcha. One of the things that you know we touched on here, uh, we touched on before as well, is is the power restoration side. Maybe this is more to the to the power side. But um, after Hurricane Michael went through the um, uh, city of Mexico Beach in the Florida Panhandle a couple of years ago, I went down there within a week or two of uh, of the storm and spent some time with crews. And you know they were obviously very frustrated. You know we saw as we saw here this the, the sawtooth pattern of recovery. There's a big outage. There's immediate sort of recovery in some circumstances, and it's kind of uh, back and forth as, as different recovery efforts take place. 
Um, in that circumstance, some of the crews I met with said they basically had to go to, to fist, fisticuffs with some of the power companies for everyone to sort of fully understand um, how do we respect this. Power companies have a, a, a very, very important job to get done quickly, uh, and so does telecom. I think we've made some progress since Hurricane Michael. Um, I think I've heard mixed stories about Ida, some some good coordination, some not good coordination. I don't know if there's, there's even more that we can do to deepen the coordination between uh, power and, uh, and telecom restoration efforts. I noticed, you know, you mentioned auger versus other sort of mechanisms, which are increasingly being highlighted. That, that's important, but I don't know if someone has some more to, to add on that point. I'd say, Commissioner, you're absolutely right. The, the challenge has changed. And, and one of the themes I think of this event has been uh, interdependencies between communications networks writ large and, and power. And, you know, we see it in the wireless world as we try to prepare for new things like de-energization. Right, intentional shut off of power. And we see it in Louisiana and Texas where there are longer outages. So you know, it's changed the game for us and the assets that we bring to the table. It's not just the traditional barnyard, but it's mobile generators, it's securing fuel, getting contracts because we know that the gas stations won't be up. Um, one provider reported that they got back to business as usual service, but it took 400 to 500 generators to do that. So I think that tells you a little bit about the scale. Um, yeah. I completely agree with the theme on coordination. It's a priority for CTIA uh, and our members. And, and I think, you know, happy to talk a little bit more about that, but it's something that we're working to do with the, the power industry across a couple of different venues. You know, we, we think that's a really important relationship. We did think we saw improvement there in Ida and, and we're looking forward to continuing to strengthen that relationship. Gotcha, one last one for me to keep it going, but uh, maybe Harold, I mean, you talk a bit about uh, backup power. I know it's something that, you know, one of the very first projects I ever worked on as a baby lawyer in 2005 when I started at a law firm was the Hurricane Katrina panel. I sort of volunteered to help out there on the law firm side. And backup power obviously was a big deal coming out of that panel and that recommendation. Understanding the public interest goals, what, what, and maybe some of the legal challenges as well, but what, what are some of the practical challenges that you sort of say, yeah, the other side, you know, there are some practical challenges to it, but they're they're overcomable for for these reasons. Can you sort of walk through some of that? Well, yes, and and I do think these challenges are overcomable. But if we're going to have uh, real uh, network resiliency, we have to recognize them. The first I want to mention is the diesel fuel access and also diesel fuel storage, uh, particularly in environmentally sensitive areas or. Uh, potentially in isolated and hard to recover areas. That's, uh, there are a lot of places where we don't want to put uh, three days worth of diesel fuel for a generator because we're worried about if it gets into the groundwater. Uh, there are, uh, however, uh, a lot of issues in prioritization, um, by which I mean, uh, um, when we have a limited resource like fuel in a disaster area, how do we prioritize um, maintaining power to the communication grid and the elements of the communications grid. I think uh, that uh, um, that uh, is something that the GAO has recently said FEMA has not uh, paid sufficient attention to. And um, I've heard stories in the past of uh, essentially people hijacking fuel um, that was bound uh, for communications uh, uh, tower generators being taken to other purposes. Finally, I do want to stress power in the home. Um, and uh, the FCC has not looked at this since its 2015 order. Uh, at that time, there was an expectation that commercial carriers that were offering um, non-powered systems, which are all uh, voice over IP systems, uh, were moving to systems that could use commercial batteries rather than the large um, and expensive uh, batteries that generally only provide two hours uh, worth of time. Um, there was a consensus that there was supposed to be a phase in from uh, the current uh, rule, which um, only requires carriers to offer at the point of sale um, a backup power system that would be good for eight hours to something where at least an eight hour, ideally a 24 hour uh, backup power uh, system would become uh, mandatory. The need for this has increased. We've heard uh, from some of the panelists about week long blackouts that make uh, essential communications uh, impossible. Uh, and this is a, uh, a very real problem. It's, it's going to be tough to solve, but it's one that we absolutely have to solve for the modern communications grid. And sorry, final, final, final follow for me on that point. Um, what, what do you, 
when we first started discussing this, you know, particularly back in 2005, I mean, it was very much a macro network still, right? Now we got small cells built in, layering, a different approaches. Your, your view, I assume, is, you know, we need to take that into account in the sense that, you know, macro sites could have more robust backup power, you know, small small cells or whatnot, just from physical capacity or, or, or just the need for them to stay up relative to the macros is, is different as your view that we should take a, a sort of a, a gradient sort of type approach? Well, I think there's a lot of room here for new thinking. Um, for example, ATSC 3.0 uh, is coming in. We've heard broadcasters maintain um, a uh, their own generation um, and have uh, significant power. It may be uh, that we should look at how ATSC 3.0 uh, uh, spectrum can be used to help supplement uh, when power is down on cell towers or on micro cells. Mm -hmm. We should, uh, one of the beauties of our modern network is that we've got a lot of redundancy here. Um, we've got a lot of different options. And instead of an everyone for themselves uh, kind of mentality or an everybody is responsible for themselves mentality, um, we should be thinking of this as one big communications grid in the geographic area uh, where we can shift uh, communications depending on where uh, power is available. Yeah, a lot of that makes sense to me. I've been sort of a, a big... Uh, Commissioner I'm, I'm, Carr. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. Yeah, I'm getting the hook. All right. Well, I'm really I'm, interested We should talk about this more here in D.C. We'll, we'll take it offline. All right. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Carr. Appreciate your interest level, and I appreciate our panelists for responding. Commissioner Starks, go ahead with your questions. Yes, well, well, thank you for that voice of God that uh, that that helped uh, that helped move move, move us along. Uh, as always, happy that uh, each of us on the commission are, are deeply interested in this, as, as the panel can tell. Uh, uh, Mr. Cravens, I wanted to start with you um, for a minute. Uh, I'm so grateful that you're here, uh, and and uh, I could not footstop more what you were talking about. Um, in making sure that uh, communities that are disproportionately impacted also have the opportunity to make sure that they are part of the build back better um, uh, type of thinking that's needed in those communities. So a, a little bit of kind of a two, two, two prongish question, you know, can you help think through that a little bit more? Is there more you'd like to share with us? One of the things that I've talked about uh, with, with Jonathan Adelstein and, and folks over there at WIA is making sure that as we're building out 5G, for example, here we're talking about rebuilding and, and building back, making sure that those crews reflect America, reflect the diversity of America, certainly in the telecom lane. Uh, and so, you know, help, help think through, are there other kind of components that you would help us think through on that kind of community uh, build out? The, the second thing is, you know, can you just share with us what uh, what the chapter down there in Louisiana uh, coming through the hurricane, what you've heard or, or what, uh, what what notes they've kind of given you back? Sure. Thank you for those questions, Commissioner Starks. I'll start with your last question first. With the Urban League of Louisiana, which serves the entire state now, um, they were on the ground and, and they were in the neighborhoods, especially in those neighborhoods that many of the men and women testified about on the first panel as well as the second panel. Some of those neighborhoods that are still experiencing power outages in their businesses. I think 46,000 businesses as of last week were still struggling to come back online. Many of those businesses, many of those businesses belong to people of color and, and people who make our neighborhoods work. And so the Urban League of Louisiana on the ground, but there people are still struggling. And we are there trying to help them as best as we can. But, but and again, as I mentioned to the chairwoman, having these types of hearings, putting the attention on these types of issues are important. It's your first question, Commissioner. Equitable investment, if we can pass a bipartisan infrastructure bill, if mm -hmm. we can do some of the things that the providers have promised they will build, 5G, um, 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 laying more fiber and, and, and laying more, more, more cable, people of color want those jobs too. We want all Americans to benefit from that economic development. We want all people to have an opportunity to participate. So that's training, that's investing, that's making sure that diverse suppliers have an opportunity to do business with these big businesses. So we're looking at equitable investment. We're looking at when we enhance critical structures, let's just make sure we have some intentionality that all Americans get a chance to participate. We, we in the African-American community, as well as in, in, in civil rights space, again, as I said to the chairwoman, we don't wanna just be viewed as victims. 
or pass or, or, or sitting on the side while people pass us by. We want to participate in the great build back. And so it's important that we think about that to both two prongs, both that those communities are vulnerable, but also how we can get those communities involved in the, in the build back. Well, great. I'll, as always, look forward to continuing that part of the dialogue uh, with you and with Urban League. Uh, Mr. Mr. Louis um, Dabdub, I hope I'm pronouncing that uh, uh, somewhat close to right. Uh, you know, one, one of the things that we heard, uh, of course, from the first panel, and, and obviously when I... Uh, when we hear about this, when we talk to providers, you know, they talked extensively about the and the challenge of working with uh, utility providers. Uh, and, and in some of your comments, you also were talking um, uh, about some of the training that you've done. Uh, can you tell us in particular, one of the issues we heard about was power cuts and fiber cuts. Uh, can you tell us how you, um, how you're seeing the better training are there any specific actions that you have found better, any data that you all are tracking and how to make sure that the response is, is better there for your company, their energy as you're dealing with responses? Uh, and then, of course, anything that the FCC should be doing to, uh, you know, better promote uh, coordination in what we all understand is the, the critical alliance between, you know, telecom, communications, and, and power. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. I, I greatly appreciate your question. And you know, one of the things we, we often say and we talk about when it's a major event, what does it take to bring a community back up? There's that three-legged stool, right? And and it's electricity, water, sewage, and then telecommunications. Those are the basic foundations we need to rebuild a community. And one of the things that's bad when one of these storms comes through, it's bad enough with the damaging costs, but then to have restoration works workers inadvertently add to that problem is something we certainly want, want to avoid. <clears throat> in the 2020 season, we learned that after that uh, season across the uh, uh, Gulf South where the impacts had happened, that several lines of the telecommunication lines had cut by uh, either emergency first responders who think doing the right, doing the right thing to clear roadways for emergency evacuations, utility responders who will cut, cut clear the poles to try to get lines back what we initially found is that people weren't educated enough about how critical those other lines were to what we're talking about here today. We seized that opportunity with our partners through EEI to talk about what we could do with the industry to upgrade that. It came down to a couple of different really simple One, what, what do we have to do for awareness for everybody who's going to be uh, doing the restoration work in our industry? How do we partner with our first responders, police, fire, EMS to make sure that they understand the criticality of those those infrastructure as well. And then how do we educate people to make sure not only look out for, but how do we communicate in real time with those partners to make a lot of people We were able to pull something together for the 2021 season that we put out. Uh, I know for us and several of our partner companies that worked with EI to do it uh, were successful. Uh, before the storm, during and after, we had a lot of communications going on like that telecommunications partners, and we put a lot of effort into doing that specific training with our partners to help get people from 43 states from around the country come down south to help us do this restore and this rebuild. So that's something they wouldn't typically think about if you're coming from someplace who doesn't affect it. So we put a lot of effort into making sure they were aware of it. And uh, from the best we can tell, there was a significant reduction in those incidents this season uh, for lines being in Cut. So it's something, look, it is not perfect by a long stretch, and we are committed to keeping that drive alive and getting better at it. Great, thank you. I, th I think uh, I'll, I'll move it along to uh, Commissioner Simon. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Starks. Commissioner Simonton. Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to direct my first question to Mr. Bergman and Mr. Dabdo. And that's uh, just at a high level. Are there sufficient legal incentives to prevent utility and communications companies from cutting one another's lines? And uh, if not, how could we improve in that area? Well, uh, thank you, Commissioner. I, I would say, you know, this is, um, as I think Louis said, uh, we realized how important this issue is coming out of Hurricane Michael. And so one of the things that we're particularly proud of is the collaboration that we um, launched in partnership with EEI, we set up a cross-sector resiliency forum to strengthen communication between our industries. And that goes 
to simple things like making sure that we all have the right contact information to developing understanding about how we prioritize restoration and um, promoting joint exercises. Uh, earlier this year, we had companies from both of our sectors together doing joint tabletop exercises to try to make sure that we can work more effectively together. And we're carrying that over into uh, the other venues where we coordinate. You know, we, we look to the National Coordinating Center uh, and to state EOCs to coordinate those on the ground operations. And one of the things that NCC launched this year was a new commercial coordination group, which really paid dividends in terms of helping us coordinate on those uh, post-disaster recovery efforts that you talked about, Commissioner. Okay, um, thank you. Um, in my, I guess I'd like to direct my, um, my uh, the other question I'd like to ask to Ms. Mastandrea. And that is, thanks very much for telling us about the work FEMA is doing to serve individuals with disabilities, uh, which is obviously very challenging under um, adverse circumstances, even more so than, than otherwise. But do you have any suggestions for how the FCC can cope with your efforts? Thank you for that question. I, I think that, um, you know, as uh, Mr. Cravens mentioned, and I think we've heard a few of the other uh, panelists mentioned today, I think the, the importance is really partnership and working together. And, and the FCC really has been a, a very good partner with FEMA in terms of uh, working on accessibility of communications and information. And I've worked very well with um, Susie Singleton and others from the FCC on, on many of these efforts. So I would say to certainly continue, continue on with those efforts. And I, I think that one of the things that we may look to do going, for, going forward is just continuing to really understand and, and work with the communities, you know, get into the communities to understand what are the issues with access to telecommunications and the impacts when the power is out and how is that impacting individuals with disabilities post-disaster. So what can we realistically do, whether it's in an urban area, in a rural area where the access is even more minimized, right? And so, um, but it's really, you know, I could come up with lots of solutions myself, but it's really about getting into the communities and understanding from their perspective what the issues and concerns are so that we can better solve for those issues instead of thinking that we have all the answers when we really don't know. Uh, so, and that's why I raised the importance of really uh, reaching out to community organizations and stakeholders. And, and the, the really key thing to think about in terms of people with disabilities as well, um, Commissioner, is that disability touches every other demographic, right? Age, gender, race, color, national origin, right? So, so uh, economic status. So you're really talking about a wide swath of our communities who are potentially impacted by these issues. And um, people with disabilities, like all of us are very dependent on our devices, but for people with disabilities who are stuck in their homes when, uh, you know, in that blackout situation, for example, who can't reach their personal care attendant and can't get services and can't get somebody in the house to help them, it's a matter of life and death. So I think these are some of the conversations that we have to have to bring the, the people together who are the potentially most significantly impacted to understand the depth and breadth of these issues so that we can solve for them. Thank you, that's hugely appreciated. And mm -hmm. I don't have anything further. All right. Well, I wanna um, thank my colleagues for their thoughtful questions uh, and especially thank panelists for uh, spending the time with us here virtually today and also uh, being uh, amenable to us asking questions down the road in the future. My, uh, my gratitude goes out to all of you. And with that, that concludes today's virtual hearing focused on improving the resiliency of communications networks in the face of disasters. So I wanna invite our panelists, they can, um, they can uh, shut off their screens and uh, we're just gonna do some old fashioned housekeeping with respect to the FCC meetings before, uh, before we close things out fully today. Um, and uh, again, I wanna thank everyone who participated in our panels today. And I also wanna thank the commission staff who helped make this hearing a reality, including Steve Balderson, Tia Cromwell, Greg Huff, Dave Kitzmiller, Rebecca Lockhart, Paloma Perez, Jeff Reardon, 
Ann Bible from the Office of Media Relations, Justin Kay, Sean Cochran, Rochelle Cohen, David Firth, Nicole McGinsis, Sanji Nakahawa, Erica Olson, and Austin Randazzo from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, Cecilia Selhoff from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, and Anjali Singh from the Office of General Counsel. Um, again, I want to remind everyone that the recording of this virtual hearing and all written statements will be submitted into the record. And at this time, I will uh, revert back to the traditional and ask them would any of my colleagues like to make announcements? Commissioner Carr. All right, we're going to take that as a no, Commissioner Carr. Commissioner Starr. I, I was muted. Sorry, I'll say no. No announcements for me other than uh, saying congratulations once again to you. Uh, I think we got a statement out on that. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks to you. Uh, Commissioner Starks. Nothing further from me. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Uh, yes, I do have one announcement. I'm delighted to announce that Marco Peraza has joined my office as um, wireline and security advisor. Uh, Mr. Peraza is most, uh, was most recently at the, the Seventh Circuit where he was clerking. Um, prior, to, uh, prior to that, he received his law degree at Penn. And um, I'm sorry, University of Pennsylvania. Um, uh, 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 and uh, then, um, and then, prior to that, he uh, he was a security engineer at Microsoft, uh, doing uh, doing security engineering work. And I think that um, I think that in this world of greater concern over cybersecurity, this is a I'm, this is a capacity I'm very fortunate to have in house. Um, and of course, uh, prior to that, Mr. Peraza uh, received his his um, undergraduate degree at Dirk. So um, we're all very excited to have him on board. I'm sure he looks forward to working with all of you and your staff. Thank you, Commissioner Symington. We look forward to working with him as well. And before we adjourn, listen, I've got an announcement. It is always bittersweet when a long serving, dedicated and valued member of the FCC family decides to retire. That is definitely the case today because I'm announcing the retirement of one of the FCC's longest serving and most cherished employees, and that's Doug Slotten. As a dedicated civil certain Doug has worked at the FCC for more than four decades. He's dedicated his entire career to the practice of communications law, mostly as an attorney advisor in the Pricing Policy Division of the Wireline Competition Bureau. Now, you should know this about Doug. He served his country in Vietnam, where he suffered significant injuries that cost him his sight and created other physical challenges. But he continued his public service career by joining the FCC. And he started in the Cable Television Bureau way back in 1975, but joined what is now known as the Wireline Competition Bureau relatively shortly thereafter. He was trained as both a lawyer and a CPA, and he is recognized throughout the commission and really throughout the industry as the authoritative resource for understanding the commission's access charge and rate making rules. His encyclopedic knowledge of commission precedent, as well as his brilliant mind, have helped generations of FCC lawyers navigate some of the thorniest issues the agency deals with. He's a patient and kind teacher. He's taught and mentored countless attorneys. He's been very generous with his knowledge and expertise. Never too busy to take a question, talk through a difficult issue, or share his thoughts, even on the things that go beyond his official assignments. And anyway, Doug has just been an inspiration to so many of us over the years, not just in the Wireline Competition Bureau, but throughout the FCC and the greater community of communications professionals. We wish him only good things in retirement, but want him to know how much he'll be missed throughout the agency and beyond. And one final programming note, in a meeting that's had lots of them, last week due to some schedule adjustments, today's 3 p.m. press conference is gonna to need to be canceled. So now, if my colleagues don't have anything further, Madam Secretary, please announce the date of the next FCC agenda meeting. The next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission is Thursday, November 18th, 2021. Until then, we stand adjourned.